what they did and all the and uh, what happened? Sorry, like we gotta do the meeting. If that's fine, we'll get it fixed. But just let us know. All right. No two minutes to. to two minutes. Well, we we always start precisely in case somebody comes roaring through the door at the last minute, so they don't miss a minute of these really interesting meetings because they're really good. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> do, 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 do. It's always funny how long it seems to... Ah, here we go. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Nelson City Council Committee of the Whole for September 21st, uh, 21st, 24th, 2018. And before we begin formal proceedings, I would there are a couple of really special announcements that uh, I would like to make and have some people help me make those announcements on behalf of our community. The first one is uh, th that uh, when we were at the... Uh, uh, Union of British Columbia Municipalities, BC Municipalities meeting in uh, Whistler this year, Nelson got a, a honorary mention for uh, our solar garden and we were called up to the front of the room with uh, other people to receive uh, recognition uh, and it was regarding community planning and development that was what we received the award for and it was the climate and energy action award so we got this award and I'm I'm really proud of it you're gonna hear about it again because uh, unfortunately our our Nelson Hydro staff who would be here to uh, receive this weren't able to come today but they'll be coming later on in October and just to let you know that when we received the award, uh, there were other communities up there with us and New Westminster pretty much took our idea and ran with it and they have a similar project in their community. The, um, and the energy in the room when we were receiving the, room, the, the award was the, the people were really happy and positive and thinking about the future and how we foster and grow alternative sources of energy. So kudos to Nelson Hydro. For, and to our community who actually came forward and said they wanted to do this project. So thank you for that, everybody. And I'd like to call up uh, Blair Weston and John Armstrong, and we're gonna talk about another award that happened uh, at UBCM. And if you two would just come up and just stand right here in front of the table. Yeah, just just yes, yeah, stand here and look at the cameras. Yeah, because we're on we're on camera, and um, and uh, there's. Sorry, put it back here. No, no, it's totally fine. It's really nice to see you both. So go ahead, Blair. Do you want to explain what happened? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Blair Weston with Forge BC. Uh, every year uh, for the past four years at U UBCM, we've given out awards uh, to communities, fifteen thousand dollar awards to communities who um, have been put forward by a member of the mayor and council within the community um, to a nonprofit. Um, this year, one of the winners uh, was submitted to us by the city of Nelson, was the Zuzi Friendship Society for their work down at Codwood Park. Um, I think Joan would be best to explain um, exactly what's going on. And John Armstrong is the president of the Nelson Izushi Friendship Society. Hey, John. Thank you. And, and uh, um, I, I just like to start by saying thank you to Mayor Kozak, the council, and the city of Nelson for nominating us for this award in the first place, and, and to Fortis BC for choosing us as one of, uh, I think as you mentioned, there are three communities in British Columbia to receive this, this award this year. Um, if the funding will allow us to continue the work we're doing at Cottonwood Park uh, and in Friendship Garden. Uh, we, we've been working over the last two years to do landscaping, upgrading of lighting. Uh, we've built a new Friendship Gate, pathways, stone steps, a viewpoint, and all of these things, including signage, which has been on our list for a while, to recognize the, the um, 
the indigenous people who were there in the beginning, the creek itself, the power plant, uh, the original Nelson Hydro power plant there, and of course the garden, and um, we, the list goes on. We hope the, the, the market can be included there too. Um, and and the, the, the award also, I think, um, really recognizes the value of uh, volunteer community groups like ours, and, and the, the work we do in providing uh, leadership, energizing people, and contributing to building our community. So we really appreciate the recognition there. Thank you both very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, okay. Do we do we want to do this? Do we okay. want to do? Okay. okay. There, there, there's a short video here. I, I'll just say one quick, other quick thing. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, when our predecessor company, West Cooney Power, had a big fight with Nelson Hydro about their first power plant. Uh, <laughs> That's a, right. A, a large, large battle. Um, 100 years, 80 years, or whatever it was. And it's interesting now that we're giving an award and helping uh, do some signage to recognize <laughs> Nelson Hydro. See, you came around. You came around. We're glad. <laughs> Thank you. Since 1987, Nelson has had a sister city friendship with ECC Japan. And for those 30 years, our volunteers have helped to um, develop friendships with the people of ECC and also raise awareness of the relationship here in Nelson. And we do this through community exchanges with our sister city, uh, through seasonal cultural events, uh, many of which take place here in the park, and uh, through this garden, this friendship garden. Cottonwood Falls Park is a historic space within the community of Nelson. Not only was it a gathering space for First Nations people, and it's a place of significance for them, but as well, it is the site for our very first hydroelectric plant that was started here in uh, over 100 years ago. The Friendship Society here in Nelson has been a very strong contributor to the community in terms of Cottonwood Falls Park and other educational events they, they do. And also by receiving this award, um, our society could continue our work uh, encouraging people to come down and visit this important historical, cultural, and environmental site and to deepen their own understandings of community and to make contributions of their own in the future. recognition for us and and you can tell by the video and the background noise in the video of the water rushing down that would tell you why there was a power plant there in the old days that was that was great thank you so much again so now let's begin with uh, I'll call our me uh, uh, formal proceedings to order here and I'll begin with our Aboriginal acknowledgement the city of Nelson acknowledges all Aboriginal people who, on whose traditional territories we stand. We honor their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. There are no late items. Uh, could I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Thank you, Councillor Warmington, seconded by Councillor Adams. All in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Um, uh, could I have a, someone move adoption of the minutes of July 23rd? Thank you, Councillor Daly, seconded by Councillor Sherbo. All in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. And now we, uh, one of the best things about our, our cultural, um, uh, about our uh, Committee of the Whole Means is we have a cultural presentation. And I think, Astrid, are you here to introduce it? Come, come forward. Greetings, my name's Astrid Herald. I'm the Executive Director of Touchstones Nelson Museum of Art and History. And today it is a bit funny. I'm here to talk to you about Mountain Bike. <laughs> so I'm, I wanted to bring the gallery to Marin Castle today and to the Committee of the Whole. Currently on display, we have a retrospective of mountain biking history. It's not a very old history, but a very relevant history to this community. So I wanted to pass around a few items. If you don't mountain bike, I'm sure you've still seen mountain bikes. You've seen little GoPros, I'm sure, which are yay big, likely. Uh, so I wanted to pass around this helmet. This is a piece of mountain biking history in British Columbia. It uh, is that the first <laughs> <laughs> this is the first helmet camp <laughs> that was created. Uh, Christian Begin is um, one of the founders of free ride mountain biking in British Columbia. He currently resides in Squamish, and uh, he shipped this helmet to us for the exhibition. So I'm, I'm going to come on up and pass it around. 
<laughs> please. Um, see, let's wait and imagine riding your bike with this helmet on. And imagine oh my God. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, they, and they did some you know, really extreme <clears throat> free ride mountain biking with this helmet on. And so imagine this. Uh, and what's so fantastic about the show right now is having youth come in who have always had a GoPro. <laughs> they, you know, that's really all they, they've seen in terms of, of, uh, of footage. And yet, how do you not get a compression fracture wearing that thing on your head? Like, I know. It's, it's, the, the photographs and the footage of um, people riding with that are quite... What year would that have been? This was in the 90s. In the 90s. In the 90s, 90s yeah. even. Like, that's yeah, not that yeah. long ago. Okay. So, uh, free ride mountain biking, or mountain biking in general, started uh, in the 70s, in the 1970s, in California, and made its way up to BC fairly quickly after that. North Vancouver, Squamish, Whistler, and then it moved its way over to Roslyn and Nelson, and then Nelson, sort of in the 90s especially, really started an incredible, uh, unique riding scene, and we have now about 118 sanctioned trails in the community. Yeah. It draws an incredible amount of tourism, art as well. So many people are inspired by mountain biking. They create. Oh, Would it fit? No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This I tried is it on when it first came in the museum. This is the camera. What's this? It's incredibly heavy. This is the battery. Oh, that's the battery. Yeah. Well, it yeah. makes sense now. Let's just say that. Yeah. So, it's a neck injury waiting to happen. That's yeah. what that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Part of what was so exciting for us to do with the show as well is not just focus on the pure facts, but also focus on the art. The art of mountain biking, but also the art that is inspired by mountain biking. So I wanted to bring over a photograph that was done by local photographer Fred Rosenberg. Mm. This is an image of Con Diamond. I'm not sure if you know him. Con Diamond is a very, he's one of the, we call first wave mountain bikers. <laughs> so in the eight, 1980s, mountain biking here in Nelson and area and they did a lot of what was called up and overs. So they were riding their bikes without any suspension, and uh, they were going mostly on, on uh, fire road, mm. just up and over a mountain. So there were no single track trails at that point. So, and Fred is, if you know his work, uh, he has the capacity to capture uh, moments in, in really striking ways and to bring uh, <coughs> the community, the sense of community that mountain biking creates to life. And so we have a number of, of uh, Fred's shots in the gallery as well. And we also have Con Diamond's bike. What's so exciting about <laughs> announcing this to the community is that archival material, so like this, and uh, historical objects, like bikes from the 80s, mm -hmm. came out of people's garages. So we have Con Diamond's 1982 stump jumper in the gallery. It looks like a cyclocross bike. There's certainly no suspension, cantilever brakes. <laughs> I would never want to ride it on a trail, but <laughs> it's really fantastic, especially for youth to come into the gallery and see what mountain biking was like before. Mm -hmm. So speaking of which, I won't take up too much more of your time, but wanted to show some shocks. This is first, first generation and second generation shocks. And I just wanted to point out um, cantilever brakes. Again, like the, the, the disc brake, when the disc brake came into, a fact it really did change. So yep. brakes don't look like that anymore? Because I think my bike still has those. Like, not not mountain bikes. <laughs> 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 not, not mountain bikes. Not really. So mountain bikes now have disc brakes. Like cars. Yes. Oh, yeah. And they have oh, they have had disc brakes for many years, sorry, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you an and idea, Con Diamond stop, when we did summit to summit, we rode from yes. the from Whitewater to the Summit Fitness Center. Con Diamond said it was too easy, so he rode from the fitness center up to Whitewater. Yeah, I'm not surprised, yeah. <laughs> so just uh, wanted to showcase some of the um, historical objects. You know, these, these objects are not 100 years old or even 50 years old, but they're still very important, relevant heritage objects from our community that have been loaned to the museum to showcase this really essential history. And it's a history that's really crucial to this community. And what's so phenomenal about this show, it's brought in so many people who've never been to the museum. The exhibition opening had 250 people there. Fantastic. Wow. And uh, I don't know the exact stats, but I would say 80%, 80% had never been in there before. Nice. Never stepped foot in the museum. So it was really a dream come true to bring this history to life um, for those who who ride, who, you know, mountain biking is such an essential part of their life, mm -hmm. but also for those who don't ride, to understand a part of Nelson that's really quite large, and mm -hmm. um, to try and get a glimpse into the artistry and the love of mountain biking that so many people 
to showcase our stars, to showcase the riders that we have, uh, Kurt Sorge among them, who's won three Red Bull Rampages. We have his bike, his trophy, and his helmet in the show. And it's um, a testament to the community, how many people came out and um, wanted to be involved, wanted to bring their historical objects, their archival photographs, and also just contribute to bringing together this really unique history to, to bring this home. So I wanted to share that with you today. How long is the display there, Astrid? It's on until November 4th. And we're talking about touring the show mm. because it just is really so relevant to this whole, to the basin, to the community. And so it would really have to be switched, of course, um, to each community because Roslyn's not going to want to see a show about Nelson riding, <laughs> of course, nor, you know, nor Revy or anywhere else. So we would really need to um, work with each local community to ensure that mm -hmm. it's really an, an authentic representation of what their community is. But, you know, looking at books or book form with Kootenai Mountain Culture, perhaps, because it's, it's a history that um, is becoming more and more discussed because it's now about 20, 30 years old. Mm -hmm. There's a film that just came out called The Moment, Free Ride Entertainment, which of course is in Nelson and has was a large part of why people started knowing about Nelson riding is because they were bringing it out internationally. They're creating another film on the history of mountain biking next next year, I believe, mm -hmm. next two years. Mm -hmm. So people are really excited about now looking back 20, 30 years and how it's evolved and how it's changed to something very rogue and uh, done by sort of a fringe community mm -hmm. to now something being very mainstream mm -hmm. where you know, a family of four goes out and rides together, <laughs> just, which is my dream. So. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. fabulous. Yeah, thank when, you so much. When we were in uh, Whistler at, at uh, UBCM, uh, there were a tremendous number of mountain bikers coming, and uh, and even in the rain, like, they were out there in full force, It and the bikes were something to see. Yes. They are nowhere near what they used to be. They're, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there is, we have a DH, we have a downhill race bike in the gallery right now, and it would be quite hilarious to compare the, the DH bike. So there's one actually, DH race bike from the um, 90s, and then right below it is Kurt Sorge's Rampage bike from 2017, the mm -hmm. bike he won on, yeah. one of his wins. <laughs> it's just really interesting to see them side by side. They're not quite incomparable, because of course it's still a bike, and it's a mountain bike that has suspension, but it's really quite intriguing to see the evolution that technology and how it's evolved. Thanks so much for your presentation today. Really informative. And if people are, uh, go to the, go to uh, Touchstones to have a look at this, um, at this installation before November 4th. And good luck with getting it on the road. That's really interesting. That would be really a good thing. Thanks. Great meeting. Um, yeah. So, um, we, uh, I'm going to move now to uh, public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to speak today? Please step forward and I'll just read our, our little... Uh... City Council welcomes comments from the public on issues it is dealing with or on other issues of interest to the public. Before speaking, please identify yourself, stating your name and place of residence and the issue you are bringing forward. Please limit your questions and or comments to a maximum of five minutes. Council will not make any decisions at this meeting about the issue you raise, but may refer them to staff for follow-up. Topics raised in this session should be of broad public interest. Complaints of a personal nature will be dealt with by staff through the city's established complaint process. Thanks for taking time to participate in this city council meeting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Klaus Alaushrinka. I live in Nelson. And I will once again talk about the Cottonwood Market. The Cottonwood Market has been the most consistently mismanaged project to, become, to come before this council over the course of almost three years, band-aided by it again and again, with altogether at least $122,600 and nothing to show for it. An obscene 40000 channeled from the CBT through council, does the CBT know? The other 82600 taxpayered. These figures do not include two checks for over $4,000 unapproved by council and made out directly to cover architecture towards something or other market. There has never been a public accounting of funds spent. Two constructs without context are the only physical proof of a new cottonwood market. 
A, an unapproved infrastructure net initiated by whom, funded how, put in place before any market design is even submitted, and B, an unapproved concrete oval platform initiated by whom, funded how, in the area of the originally envisioned and rejected bandshell number one. There undoubtedly will be yet another funding chapter involving the next council in the bromance of city management with cover architecture, financially possibly the only ones really ahead in all this. Bandshell history. When the rendered purpose-defying reincarnation of the market is rejected, it is done without the public being informed as an in-house decision only. But word is out eventually with Nelson coming to assume the whole project is dead. So. When the shell number two proposal pops up unexpectedly after a lengthy period of total market silence from City Hall, the general tepid reaction is, what's the point without the market, like who needs it, and not cover architecture again. This group, coming from self-promoting entitlement, presents to council an incomplete version of its new band shell, initiated by whom? Regardless, it is promptly accepted in principle by council. Much like Hans Christian Andersen's tale, The Emperor's New Clothes, Council the Dim Emperor, and Cover Architecture, The Crafty Tailors, here asking for 40,000 pieces of gold. By the time of funding approval or not in the regular council meeting, 4th of July 2017, Nelson has seen finished renderings of this shell. Again, a design not focused on functionality, here acoustics and shelter, but only on an experiment with a new process of using wood in construction, documented exhaustively off point. The design itself is visually awkward at, be at best, with the concrete evil, uh, evil, with the concrete oval, not part of this number two either. In this meeting, one of the architects is allowed to make a highly irregular presentation, touting a range of possible uses for their band shell, originally thought to be only a performance space, now it's for weddings. There's a rendering of a happy couple in full wedding drag sitting in the shell. Imagine them parking, schlepping furniture and whatever wedding stuff through heat and dust or rain and mud. Anyway, council's approval of the $40,000 turns out to be a charade. There's no weighing of positives versus negatives. Clearly, the unanimous decision has been reached before this meeting. This is the last Nelson learns of the band shell and cottonwood market period over one year ago. Then told by CAO Cormac the shell would be in place this summer. Well, it isn't and clearly won't be. What was summer over? The market closing in a few weeks and all funds gone. My questions right now, right here. One, what happened to the 40,000 specifically band shell dollars? Two, what happened to the other? 86,600. Thank you. Uh, any comment, Council? Um, I would suggest you might want to attend a budget meeting because that's when all I these. I hear you. I said I would suggest you might want to attend a budget meeting because that's when all these projects are, are presented. So, uh, Colin McClure, our CFO, maybe contact him, ask him when budget meetings are. And I can assure you, every expenditure of the city of Nelson is approved in the financial plan. I don't have a problem. I don't want to debate with you. No, no, I don't. You that's, neither do that's I. I don't have a problem with with these funds not being around or not yeah. being used. So if you look at, but I have a problem with the public not being notified where one hundred and twenty-two thousand six hundred dollars plus another four thousand dollars went because we don't have a cottonwood market. The proof is in the not being there. Mr. Cormac, that's if it. You, if you that's all it is. One hundred and twenty-six thousand six hundred dollars plus four thousand, and no cottonwood market. Come to the. I've been to all the meetings where these things were approved, and they were approved. Forty thousand dollars were approved for the band shell over a year ago. You said the band shell would be in place this year. The the plans, the design, all of that stuff was in place. They were ready to go. The money was approved, the $40,000 were approved. Why don't we have a band shell? You said that there would be a band shell this summer. Summer is over. The market will close any minute now. And where's the money? If you look at the budget. It Thank was, you it very went, much. If you look at the I budget. Do, I have looked. I have looked. I don't want to go on with this. 
It is the money. The money has not been used towards whatever. Just one yeah. moment. I'm, I'm going to have um, Councillor Daly wanted to make a comment, and then yeah. we, will, we will complete. Go ahead, Councillor Daly. I'm just at a bit of a loss because I don't know where to start. I heard a number of things said that uh, are, have no basis, that there's uh, nothing to show for it, that there's no public accounting of funds. Uh, all of that is refutable in that we do have uh, accounting uh, reports on a monthly basis here on uh, at City Council that there has been a review of what's been happening and an updated with this council as this has proceeded uh, there have been no decisions made in private that have have not had the public opportunity to be part of so I'm just I, I'm left with how do I respond when I hear a lot of things that aren't true being said that it, it, it becomes fictional entertainment if it's May I suggest that I've done this before, that you are really, really careful with talking about fiction. You have called this, when I brought this up before, you had called it untrue, with, again, today, you're very close to calling me a liar, Councillor. Not good. Not good. So back off. Really, back off. Okay. Do you understand me? Thank you. You're repeating what Mr. Cormack said. You said okay. you're saying nothing else. But just a little something for everybody. I'm oh. done. Okay, thank you, thank you. This is, this is, these pieces of wood are from the cottonwood market we used to have. When it was torn down, I went there one day just to see what it looked like, and something made me pick up these pieces of wood, and I thought it would be okay to bring them today. Thank you. All right, we'll just uh, wait. Thank you for that. Okay, no, thank you. All right, so um, let's, we'll continue. And um, before we continue, I am going to allow staff to just respond to, a, there were two questions around factual um, um, uh, timelines and things that, uh, that were questions, and I'd like you to give you a chance to respond to those two questions. Sure, I, I think the first part is uh, the Azushi Friendship Society um, just recently was awarded a, a um, Fortis community grant, which competes all across the province for this project. So I think that's worth noting that um, there's certainly a lot of community involvement and community interest in this project. Uh, as far as the project, as council knows, uh, the stage part was always based on uh, raising additional grant funding, the 15,000 that Azushi will, will help towards uh, finishing that project and we do uh, again have a grant application before CBT that hopefully will do the balance you know, the work that I think many or some people don't recognize is that all the uh, preparation work for a project like that underground work for utilities underground work for electrical all those are, are part of the project um, so those are you know those hidden things are, are always a, a big part. And in fact, this was a interesting site when they uh, excavated that site, they found the old um, tanks for the, the fish hatchery <coughs> way back when was part of that site. So we're always, always find uh, interesting parts. Archeological dig. <laughs> yeah, there was a we, fish hatchery there? Yeah, that was where yes. the fish hatchery used to be. <coughs> You're a newbie. Yeah. One day we're hoping to restore fish to Cottonwood Lake, but uh, or Cottonwood uh, Creek, but you never know. And and uh, so at this point in time, we're waiting for uh, additional funding to complete the project. And uh, the reason it wasn't completed this year is because we did not have the funds to complete, and uh, we, and those those applications are are moving forward. Correct. Thank you. Thanks for that. All right, moving right along. Uh, is there, oh, is there anyone else here from the general public that uh, would like to participate in our... All right, thank you. We'll move on to the Canadian Federation of University Women, Nelson and District Club. Please come forward. We have a presentation from... 
Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are going to be a little less controversial, and we are going to be a little less entertaining than the mountain biking. Anyways, um, we are members of the Canadian Federation of University Women, Nelson, and District Club. My name is Kathy Lidner. I am the president of the club. This is Allison Hutchison, who is our past president, and Stephanie Myers, who is one of our vice presidents. Um, a year ago, we stood before you to tell you a little bit about our history of our club because we celebrated eight years, um, woohoo, which was great, and we had a wonderful event. And also, um, at that time, um, you had awarded for our service for 50 years of our club a fin financial contribution towards our scholarship fund. And we want to, we, in writing, we thank you, but we'd like to thank you again and say um, how wonderful it was that we could award another $50,000 scholarship um, in $1,000. $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> $1,000. <laughs> $1, <laughs> $1, <laughs> $1, <laughs> $1,000. Uh, uh, yeah. graduated from LVR, mm -hmm. um, a David woman by the name of Andriana Bergman, who is now attending um, Selkirk and has received her scholarship. And just to refresh your, mem your um, memories is that um, our club is one of 100 clubs that are across Canada. So there's like 99 other clubs. Um, our national association, um, we fund a lot of scholarships, well over a million dollars in scholarships annually. In our club, we try to award at least um, $3,000 worth of scholarships every year to young women entering into post-secondary education. We are a nonpartisan, self-funded organization, um, which our mission is to work towards the improvement of the status of women and girls as well as the promotion of quality public education, justice, and peace. Um, last year when we were here, we were um, telling you about our um, fun, one, a fundraiser, but also our 50th anniversary celebration, where we had invited Daphne Brownman to come speak, who has been researching and advocating for the women of Children of Bountiful for the last 17 years. Um, reviewing and bringing to the attention the, the human rights violations against these women and children. So following our event that we had, um, we ended up doing some advocating on behalf of the women. And Allison's going to just share a little bit of um, sort of the avenue that we took. So as you know, Daphne Bremen is quite a celebrated author mm -hmm. and journalist. And last year uh, when she was here, some of the women who were members of the Bountiful community and had left came over to hear Daphne speak. They wanted to hear what she was saying about them and about their community. And um, afterwards, they met with Daphne, and she, she encouraged them to begin to advocate for themselves. So they formed a group. It's called Safety Net in the Kootenays. And they have a Facebook page. You can go and look it up if you like. And they invited us. We went over in October to Cranbrook, and we were the first um, official meeting that Safety Net of the Kootenays had with another you know, external party. And they shared with us, the, the women that were there, their stories. And I got to tell you, we were, we were just shocked. We were shocked mm -hmm. to hear the details of how, what, they, what they had gone through. But um, through that, they had done a lot of things. They started meeting with um, providers of social services in Cranbrook and in Creston. And we actually, Kathy and I, had an opportunity. We went over to Creston to film one of the ladies because we said, we want to share your stories. And when we did her interview, she also said to us, would you like to come and see Bounty, as she called it? And so we got to go yeah. look through Bountiful and see where Winston Blackmore lived and see where Warren Jeff's sides lived and what they had built and all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah. it was a really amazing opportunity. We're trying to keep that connection going now. And we, we actually gave them money for a scholarship for ed education funding for those ladies. And, and when, we, when we spoke with them, we asked them, we said, what can we do to help, right? We don't want to do anything to them. We, they've had enough done to them. We're saying, what can we do to help? The one thing they said to us that was really important was the education piece. Um, the children in Bountiful, um, many of them are homeschooled. And so with that, we went back and we started doing research around um, the education that in children get in closed secular communities. So what we did, we had drafted a resolution that goes to our national. And in June, um, the, the 
resolution speaks to oversights that are there in some provinces with regard to homeschooling programs. And so what happens, you have many children across the country falling through the cracks because they aren't receiving um, education about so, uh, social justice education or education about their own human rights. And so we drafted a paper, like a position paper and a resolution that went to our national body, which was voted for all across Canada, and it was accepted. So right now we have our national group that puts together a resolution package. So all of our 100 clubs across Canada will be advocating to many different avenues of, governor, of governance. For example, some will go to, for example, MPs, some will go to MLAs, some of the advocating that we'll be doing will also be going to what's called the Council of Ministers of Education across Canada. Um, anyways, that was, so we've been busy and we thought you had asked us to come back to talk about women in leadership, so we wanted to let you know sort of where we left off with that. Um, so we continue, our work continues with that. And we have, Allison and I have actually presented to all the BC clubs in um, June. We were in North Vancouver and we've got um, clubs from around BC now that are supporting Safety Net because as you know, um, our government has um, done an injustice to those women and children living there. And it's time that people step up and do something. Agreed. Then our next thing that we did was we decided, well, let's look at our own backyard here. And we went and met with some of our um, outreach workers, um, um, counselors that work directly with women and children right in the area. And we have kind of put together some of the issues that they're facing. And Stephanie's going to share that with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, women in Nelson and area face many of the same challenges as they do across the provinces, across all the provinces, such as access to reliable, safe, and affordable housing, transportation, and employment. Um, with the affordable housing here in Nelson proper being very limited, lots of women are um, forced to live outside of Nelson, which makes an added um, challenge for access to employment and transportation. These struggles are compounded if the mothers are, uh, if the women are mothers. Uh, and if the women in, are primary caregivers, finding affordable and reliable and safe childcare um, is almost impossible, um, especially if the woman is working shift work for minimum wage. Um, these situations force women to make choices that are some very difficult to make. There's a real need in the community for a second stage housing once le leaving the Amy Bowler house. As some issues need to be um, addressed at the provincial level, the local government can advocate for such issues as an increase in local legal aid, more trauma-informed practices among local doctors, and increased local services for mental health and child and family services. Mm. Thanks. And another um, group that um, many of you would be familiar with is the Nelson Bauer Committee. Um, we have been working with them recently, which is a Nelson's long-established interagency group working to advance initiatives related to violence against women in relationships. And this group was quite excited because they um, successfully obtained a provincial grant to host a regional conference on the subject of human trafficking, sexual exploitation, exploitation of women and children. And so they, there is a group, an organizing group here uh, that is going to be um, offering a conference that will bring in experts that are from BC and other provinces and it's going to be held um, May 22nd and 23rd, thought that would be of good interest. And in closing, um, we just have one other event we'd like to share with you. Um, we like to raise funds for our scholarships because that's something that we do. The post-secondary education for women is near and dear to our hearts and our mission. Um, in March, actually the date March 30th, I suggest you write that down, we are going to be hosting another SIP Talks, which is a Stories Inspire Passion. And it will feature seven dynamic Kootenai women who will share their personal stories. It'll be a wine and tapas event um, where you will get to hear the stories, you'll get to socialize and help us raise funds for scholarships. Our last SIP Talks was held in 2016 and um, our Honorable Mayor Deb Kozak was one of our speakers who did a fabulous job. I know there was a couple of counselors that attended the um, event they can tell you themselves it was a lovely event and it was lots of fun. 
and so we are going to be doing another one so I encourage more participation from all of you and put the word out there it's for a really good cause it goes towards scholarships for young women in the community plus it's also a great way to celebrate the collective spirit of Kootenai women which is very strong and um, so in closing we'd like to thank you for your time and one last thing oh yes we are co-hosting again for oh, almost God, 40 yeah. years oh, now yeah. the uh, municipal all candidates uh, yes you today. are yeah. on october the 16th so if you're running again please yes and, and not with, again, with that <laughs> with that for those of you who have made the difficult decision to not um, run again in the election we thank you for your dedication and your commitment we know it's a difficult job, but we thank you so much. And those of you who are running in the re-election, um, good luck to you, and we wish you all the best, and we look forward to seeing you at our all-candidates debate. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just one moment. We've got a couple of questions here. So, Is this the safety net in the Kootenays? I'll hold it. Um, hold it. I've got uh, Councillor Daly first, and then I've got Councillor Purcell. Go ahead, Councillor Daly. Thanks for your presentation. I wonder if you could forward the position paper and resolution that you've put forward to your national group, uh, either an email or in hard copy, and we'll get a copy. Sure. Yeah. As well, the list of needs within our community, I'd be interested in seeing that yeah. as well, please. Sure, sure. Yeah, Thanks. I can put, send that to you. That yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I was just wondering no, if you uh, Purcell, did you, I, Councillor Purcell? It's for him on the... October 16th. 16th? Yep. Where? And what time? 811 Stanley Street. This is the usual place. Central School. Central School. Central and it's... Uh, I think, Councillor, that they've sent emails to all of us. Yeah. You it's did? from 7 till 9. 7 till 9. Yeah. Councillor, they've sent us emails all to each oh, uh, teacher. Our moderator this year is Liesl Forst. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought it would be a good way to add a little levity That's with really a great. very sober great. situation. Yeah. And I to remember for and many to reasons. And yeah. questions about the dogs. Anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Great presentation. And thanks for your great work in community. Um, um, you women amaze me. That you, you do really excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jim. Wild Safe BC, Mr. Mr. White's here. Now this will be a totally different presentation. That's what's great about Committee of the Whole. I uh, wish I could be more uh, uh, positive after some of the ones we've had earlier, but uh, I'm gonna be talking about skunks and rats and other uh, such nice subjects, but. <laughs> so I've been here before, I think, once or twice, um, and I realized that in my presentation before, I never really covered over uh, some of the roles that I do. Uh, I guess you know that I, I, I communicate with the public and I uh, also write articles which go into the paper and I go on the radio from time to time. Um, so I just wanted to, at the beginning of my presentation, just to kind of go over some of the things that I do uh, apart from that. Um, so I do a lot of school programs. I think I haven't uh, tabulated my numbers I've done this year, but I think I've done well, close to 50 presentations over the summer here, going into schools, talking at Kokanee Creek, um, daycares, uh, Forest Path uh, program. I have a bit of a cooperation with uh, uh, Malin on with the Forest Path program. Uh, so essentially, just teaching uh, you know safe uh, safe uh, behavior around uh, animals that can be dangerous, and also how to avoid attracting them to your to their houses, uh, so that they can act as little ambassadors uh, for their parents. Nag their parents. Don't don't put your garbage out the night before. Um, a brochure distribution so we have more and an increasing number of brochures all discussing safe activity or safe uh, best practices with uh, most of these different species uh, seem to get at least one or two new ones every year uh, so I make sure that they're well distributed throughout the area here at many of the locations that they would be best uh, suited such as uh, pub uh, most many um, businesses uh, the information center uh, forestry center uh, things like that um, and I do door-to-door -door campaigns, many of that in cooperation with Jason and Nathan, the uh, CEOs. Um, they'll often uh, let me know whether they're having some problems in a neighborhood, and I'll go and this year has been uh, an interesting year because normally most of my activity is revolves around the black bear, which tends to be about 90% of the complaints in BC uh, when it comes to animals, wildlife, but this year has been different, so we'll, get it, we'll talk about that a little bit here. But uh, Markets and booths, so Canada Day, uh, Cottonwood, uh, 
uh, Balfour, uh, Harob, um, even Salmo this year I'm covering because we have a shortage of uh, coordinators for that area. Uh, so I've done num many number of booths uh, and also at the college uh, uh, community connect days there or the connect days for the students. Uh, I do some bear spray training. This is at the high school, but I've uh, done it also with Valhalla Pure, which is uh, one of the main um, uh, retailers for bear spray in town. So I figured if I tell, teach the staff at uh, Valhalla Pure how to properly use bear spray, that they can communicate that to their uh, customers so that people don't use it as a similar to bug, bug repellent. Um, <laughs> Uh, and garbage tagging, which is uh, something that I do uh, in evenings uh, before garbage collection the next day. Uh, I don't see a big problem in the uh, situation of putting garbage out early. I find it's 99% uh, plus uh, compliance with the bylaw 3198. And Dave, you commented, I know when we met with you, uh, your, the uh, rest of the team was quite um, complimentary to Nelson, you know, you don't see those compliance rates in mm -hmm. many other parts of the province. No, no. I mean, according to the, um, Frank Ritzy, the head coordinator, he's he's based out of Kamloops, and they said that they often run out of those those yellow stickers when they go out uh, the night before. Mm -hmm. So I usually place three to seven. Seven, I think, is the maximum I've ever placed mm -hmm. in a night. Uh, but the average, I'd say, is about three for the, per garbage zone. Uh, so not too bad. Good compliance. Yeah. Bears and Nelson. So this year actually has been, uh, for Nelson, it's been a, a low average year for bear complaints. Province-wide, it's the record low for bear complaints this year. Really? So where have all the bears gone? Now we don't know. Yeah. Uh, who knows, but actually we've been getting some reports. One of our coordinators was getting some reports from uh, loggers that work at higher elevation that they've been seeing increased number of bears. So maybe they're staying higher up <laughs> for this summer. Yeah, one on our doorstep about a week ago. Yeah, I had one actually about a week or two ago too. I, I think I was eating the clover off my uh, off my back uh, back lawn. <laughs> um, so cause of bear complaints in Nelson for let's say 2017. Here I, I covered 2017, which was a more higher average year. Uh, so garbage tends to be the uh, by far the largest uh, um, attractant for for bears in Nelson. Yeah. Um, even given that mostly people don't put it out at night, it's, uh, it's something that occurs like right throughout the season that the bears are out. Mm -hmm. Whereas fruit trees, you know, is a, is a big attraction for the time of year that it's out, but it's only for a month or so, right? So, um, so yeah, 70% of bear complaints are a result of garbage. Mm -hmm. um, this year is the year of the cat and not the Chinese year of the cat, but uh, the cougar. Um, cougar complaints are at an all time uh, high. Um, and this, I don't know actually if this is a, uh, consistent with the province-wide complaints, but, but for Nelson, uh, we've never had a year with this many uh, cougar complaints. Uh, and we've had, mostly on the North Shore, uh, uh, they've been kind of working their way from uh, Johnson Road all the way to Six Mile and killing all sorts of uh, pets and chickens along the way. Uh, so it's been a pretty busy year for me, uh, going door to door to talk about uh, cougars and getting people to uh, try and keep their pets in between dawn and dusk and make sure that their children are not uh, unsupervised playing outside. Um, and it's, it's also been uh, a record year uh, in North America for uh, cougar attacks. Uh, there's been more fatalities this year than, which is only two, uh, but that's about uh, a decade's worth of fatalities. So we had one fatality in Oregon and one in Washington earlier in the summer. But there's also been uh, two attacks in the Kootenays, one in Fernie and one in uh, Christina Lake on young children, which didn't result in fatalities, thank goodness, but uh, it does seem to show that there is an interesting trend. It could be to do with fires, uh, maybe driving the cougar's prey down into uh, more populated areas. I, that's kind of a theory I'm, I'm just kind of putting forward, but I don't have any uh, data to prove that. Could the dry weather have something to do with it? Um, dry weather, I don't think, probably more the fires because, you know, like, like if you look where fires are more actioned, uh, they're more actioned close to human habitation. And so if the fires are being, you know, a serious problem higher up, then it's going to drive the prey like the deer and whatever into, into more close to humans. So it might also. Uh, and then when the cougars come, even though they're uh, following the deer, when they see a cat or they see a dog or something like that, they're going to go for the low-hanging fruit rather than 
try and catch a deer, which is much harder. So that could be. Um, so uh, one thing I kind of wanted to discuss with the uh, council was um, was waste management. Um, we've had a, a few problems. This was earlier in the summer uh, at uh, LVR, um, and it's uh, was a result of um, a complaint from um, one of the maintainers at the schools, at the school district eight, uh, that was complaining about metal lids on waste management bins, um, and so they uh, requested without really doing too much. Um, uh, thought into it, I think, uh, to replace it with these plastic lid bins you can see here. Uh, and of course, right away, two bears started accessing these bins and then started becoming seriously habituated and then became a nuisance on 6th Street. Uh, Jason and Nathan had to destroy both bears, so this resulted in two dead bears. Um, and so this is kind of something that I've been kind of, I've t tried communicating with waste management. Um, these bins now have been uh, returned back to a metal lid. Um, but that's just actually at uh, LVR, so I'm going to have to try and get them to replace all the metal lids at, through the SDH schools. Yeah. Um, but there's an, a number of options from waste management that is available if the um, uh, if the client requests it. Um, so uh, this lid here is is be much better than the plastic lid in preventing bears, but it's not perfect. Uh, this is a better uh, bin that they offer, which has a bear bar on there or a, uh, kind of a bar. And then they actually have this uh, bin here, which is very rare. I think there's only maybe two in all of the area of Nelson. And this one's almost entirely bear-proof, but even though you can see this one, the bear has worked on it. This is at uh, Mary's Hall. Uh, you can see it's a little, a little bent it in. <laughs> but, it, but it is, I mean, it's got uh, the self-sealing lids similar to the haul all bins that you guys have been putting into the parks, uh, which alone is, is really good. And then it's also got a bear bar as well. Um, and this is available to any client that actually requests it and would make the bins fairly bear proof. Not that anything is bear proof. We usually say bear um, resistant because there's always a bear out there that figures out a way. But uh, I'm not going to re recommend anything to the council here in this regard. This is all food for thought, but um, it's possible that we could have a discussion with waste management to uh, see if they could switch them all. And if not, maybe it could be a bylaw that would come about because really uh, as we can see from just from the LVR situation it, it does uh, cause damage to the public because once a bear starts to become habituated as a result of garbage they they do cause damage to properties um, but and it does uh, ultimately result in the death of the bears which uh, as we can see from um, Kokanee Creek for instance the last several years and Pigeon who's now uh, managing the park there uh, is the operator um, she's instituted a really strict garbage and food control policies within the park, uh, confiscating uh, people's coolers if they don't. And they haven't had to destroy any bears in the park in the last several years. And bears that have been living uh, kind of in that park area, kind of on the perimeter of uh, the campground, uh, continue to live there uh, peacefully uh, and not, um, you know, come into problem with people. So. Garbage is kind of a bit of a gateway drug for bears. It uh, brings them in close to people, fruit trees as well, um, but not right through the air. And what happens is they, when they get um, accustomed to being around people, um, it becomes a situation where they become habituated and then they become more assertive or aggressive and looking for food and breaking into sheds and, and things like that. So um, anyway, so I, I looked at some other options as I've been kind of traveling around the region and um, uh, this is one unit that I thought I would bring up to the city because we've been putting in, the city's been doing a really great job in putting in haul all bins. Uh, but I thought you might want to see that haul all actually has another unit which is maybe a little more attractive should you decide to ever go for a downtown uh, bear resistant bins. And so this is a IBC, IGBC certified unit which is also sold by haul all. So I thought I'd just show that to you. And I know you guys are also um, in discussions or thoughts about uh, what to do about garbage collection and so I thought maybe I would bring up Canmore uh, and I'm not, not sure if this would work for Nelson but they have these self-depositing garbage bear resistant dumpsters uh, right through town uh, which um, people can just go and deposit their garbage directly into the dumpster and they don't have to wait for collection in fact you wouldn't need collection other than the emptying of these bins so I just thought I'd bring that up as something that, uh, in case nobody really brought it up or thought about it. 
Um, uh, one of the other issues too, along with the, um, in talking to Bruce at the uh, SD8, um, uh, one of the other issues they had was that uh, if they lock their bins, uh, what happens is people put garbage beside the bins, like a lot of local people will just put garbage right next to the bin because uh, they're used to, I guess, using the bin as their own kind of collection thing. So um, this would kind of eliminate problems like that because then people have their own dumpsters they can just immediately put their garbage into. It also would alleviate, I guess, the uh, complaints, I guess, about a uh, bi -week or bi-monthly collection. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> But anyways, it's just food for thought. I'm not really recommending anything. I just thought I would uh, bring that up. Okay, Rats and Nelson. So new, this is something, you know, I was supposed to actually talk to you guys, uh, was it a month and a half ago or something? And somehow something got mixed up. I didn't get onto the, onto the um, uh, agenda, but uh, we haven't had which is kind of good because if I had come to talk to you before, then this would not have been uh, an issue. It came to my attention in uh, July. Somebody called and or sent an email with a picture of a rat that they, their neighbor's cat had caught. Uh, and so, um, I think when uh, Frank and uh, Mike and my, I were talking to Kevin, um, I think it was, was it two years ago or a year and a half ago? At that time, we didn't have rats in Nelson. So, this is something that seems to have uh, happened in the last uh, year or two. Do we know where they came from? No, we don't know for sure. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a second here. Um, uh, so, what I did is I immediately um, instituted a uh, policy where I'm kind of uh, developing a database. Any complaints, people can or, uh, call them in to me or send me an email, and I'll record it on a database with the location so that I can kind of map it. I don't have, I only have about seven reports so far, um, so it's not really uh, large enough of a, um, uh, not enough numbers to actually really uh, identify like you know, hot areas within the city, but uh, uh, it does seem to be that they're more, like you can see just from these little red dots, that's where the sightings are from, um, that it's a more of a, a Fairview issue. Um, but there has been, I just get, got one sighting the other day uh, from, uh, where was it again? Uh, Stanley and Hoover. Um, so they may have spread also to other parts of the city. Um, typically, I mean, historically, these guys would transport themselves. They, they initially uh, evolved in Southeast Asia, um, and then they spread through the Roman Empire's trade networks into Europe. And these are the guys that are responsible or were blamed for the Black Death in the 1300s, which killed a third of Europe. But uh, that's kind of being put into question nowadays. It's, uh, I think they were thinking maybe it was gerbils, but uh, not the rats. But, and maybe the rats were also the victims as well as the humans. Um, <laughs> gerbils? Yeah, gerbils. I know. <laughs> they were one of the amazing things that they're doing through DNA. Um, so th these are. So there was one lady, I guess, that lives close to Gyro, who had caught a rat about in 2017, and had that one identified as a Norwegian rat, which is a rat that you find more commonly in New York City. Um, but these guys are. Uh, Ratus. Yeah, these guys are ratus ratus. These ones, that one was ratus norvegicus. But every single one that has been any photos that I've been seeing, and you can tell the difference because the uh, the ratus ratus or the black rat or roof rat, uh, its uh, tail is longer than its body. And so, if you find a rat with a tail longer than its body, then it's a it's a ratus ratus, um, and it's very common. Uh, they've been in in Vancouver since the 1800s, and uh, Creston now has quite a. Uh, a number of them so it could have come from either direction uh, probably either on a train or a transport truck um, two two reportings I got were both were near Savon so it could have been a truck that was delivering food at Savon I don't want to blame a particular company because it's not their fault rats mm -hmm. have their own methods of getting around and it's not anybody's fault um, so yeah it, it was interesting though because as soon as I got the report on 900 block of uh, 3rd Street I started to do door-to-door -door in that block and I went further, I went uh, past uh, 900 block and everybody kind of had an, either an experience or a knowledge of the rats on that block. But as soon as I hit 800 block, it seemed to disappear. Oh, how odd. Yeah, and then when I look at the majority of these reports, uh, second, third and fourth street, uh, it's all in the same area. So um, now there's the train tracks that come by there. So it could have gone off the train. 
how did we escape having them for so long? Like that's, seems- that's, that's the miracle. Not, it's not so much that we, the yeah. thing that we have them now, but that we haven't had them until now. Um, so some predators. Um, yeah. So I mean, the thing is, is that controlling them, it's uh, there's, this is the one that was first reported to me. You can see the tail much longer than the body. Mm-hmm. This is from Third Street. Um, so according to this, majority of them are the black rat, and then I just have the one reporting them, the Norwegian. So we do have a native species of rats here. They're not close as closely related. They're not ratus. They have another genus. Um, it's called a Pack rat, you've probably heard of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it has a bushy tail, yeah. so oh, probably requires. Uh, but it is long, but it is bushy, so it tells it's, me that it's bigger too, isn't it? Yeah, no, not much, I don't think, but a little bigger. Yeah, these rats can get pretty big depending on on what they've been feeding on. Um, so, yeah, as far as the rats go, so I mean, the the issues that that cause the rats and also cause the skunks are are correlated. So whatever we do to control skunks is also going to control the rat situation as well, and bears as well to a degree. Uh, so I, what I did is, um, I, I, before the rats, I didn't put rats in there because I I'd put this together for the last uh, presentation and, and I didn't know about the rats at the time. So I kind of um, assembled a, a collection of things. I kind of went around the city and saw some of the things that are uh, kind of contributing to the skunk issue within the city. Um, and so... This is on Third Street. Uh, you can see this. This if you can't really see it in this picture, but right above the entrance stair, this is a family of skunks living in here on the 600 block of Third Street. Right above that entrance, it says 1931. So that's a pretty old. Must be one of the oldest Sorry. sidewalks in the city. So over time, you know, concrete works and that they start to uh, give way underneath or start to create little shelters for for animals like skunks. But this would also be good for rats as well. Um, things like this. This is on Latimer Street, I think, just close to uh, just one block south of South Nelson School. Uh, things like this are, are make for really good shelters. And, and one of the things I've found working with skunks is that is that the, one of the biggest limiting factors. You can control the food, you can, can try and control the water, but the biggest limiting factor is, I think, controlling the shelter. Okay. If you control shelter, what happens is you you force them to move on. Uh, unkempt lawns, tall grasses makes for really good skunk habitat because it allows them to travel uh, from one spot to another in safety. Uh, piles of crap all over the place is kind of a, another thing for them. If people don't move the stuff very often, then it creates little uh, kind of shelters for them. Uh, open compost, that's a big one. So limiting the food for the skunks. So there's one lady um, who had a skunk issue I was dealing with on 2nd Street last year. Um, and I went to her property. She had a really low deck, like about three inches or four inches off the ground. It went, went really far, so it created a really nice shelter for skunks. <laughs> but she also had a compost, which was wide open, and it was only about that tall, because skunks don't climb very well. Uh, so it was only that tall. So it was basically like a, a buffet for the skunks. It was a huge watermelon on there when I got there. And I said, well, you've got food, you've got water, or you've got shelter. All you need now is the water. And she said, well, my neighbor has a, has a pond. <laughs> And so, so right there you have all the three things that they need all within a very short distance. The shorter distance they have all, the, all their needs from their shelter, then the less distance they have to travel and put themselves at risk. Um, this one here has had skunks living under it for about two years. This is the, um, or at least two years as I know it has probably been longer. Um, um, was that the uh, baseball diamond at, um, on 5th Street there? So you can see that little, and I actually watched the skunk come down the embankment and go in under there. So, <laughs> so if that was to be raised up or or somehow have mesh or, uh, or skirting put into the ground, that would deny that skunk the access to that. Um, things like this little, if somebody were to put skirting or or mesh or whatever to prevent them from going under there, piles of wood. Uh, and this is a big one in Nelson, old sheds that nobody uses anymore that the door is just cocked open a little bit. Total skunk habitat. I mean, you can go in there and, and the skunk, it's like a mansion for a skunk. Yeah. And of course, uh, overwatering lawns. So I can't do much about it now with all the rain, but uh, midsummer, if you water your lawn regularly and you see robins all of a sudden hopping along on your lawn in the, in the daytime, then you're gonna have skunks and raccoons on your lawn in the nighttime. Because what happens is it drives up the worms out to the surface and uh, nice juicy worms are good. Good food for skunks. So. Mm. 
Is there anything else you can do lawn-wise? We don't water our lawn, but I have little holes all over the place from skunks digging. Yeah, well, uh, well, the thing I would say is I wouldn't recommend what you would have to do um, is basically, you know, uh, you, you, you know, Mississauga or places like that, you know, people would put pesticides and stuff on their lawn. So you don't really want to recommend that. So it's something you just have to live with. But if you, if you limit the other factors, then this isn't as big a deal. So basically skunk proofing a property, this is basically a picture from Mississauga, you know, skunk proof property, no old structures, no tall grass, you know, everything is, uh, all, garbage is, you know, kept in, in, uh, in bins. Um, and essentially Nelson is kind of on the border between, you know, like, like for instance, where I live up Mountain Station, I've never once seen a skunk up there. And that's because we have uh, all sorts of predators uh, that take care of them. Right. Once you get into the city and you have a concentration of humans, then the predator numbers drop. Uh, and so the other thing, you have to go the other way to gentrification. Right. So wildification or gentrification. And that's the only way you're going to control the, the animals. If you do that, then then what it does is it forces them to travel longer distances. And they're taken care of by their three main predators. The biggest one being the owl. So up in Mountain Station, we have lots of horned owls. Yeah. And that takes care of all the skunks for us up there. What do they do? Get the young? What's that? They get the young? Is that what they do? No, they get them young and old. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, except for the really fat, mature ones. But <laughs> yeah. It's, they, what, they, harm, what harm do skunks do? What harm do they do? Well, apart from the smell and digging up the lawns, nothing it's not much. The skunks, it's the dogs that cause the smell. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I mean, one time, well, I was, I was, um, we had one area of the city which was a real skunk ha uh, haven, and uh, so I was doing a lot of work there. And one time, in the middle of the night, I was going up the alleyway, and there was three or four skunks in that laneway. Mm -hmm. And uh, the skunks still do all sorts of displays, and and like I was just kind of going by it, and he was doing displays. He was doing handstands, and kind of tail was kind of coming up like that and stuff. But they don't, they won't spray you, because they they're they only have so much spray, and they don't like to waste it. Um, yeah, they, they, what I understand, they can't see very well. So if you don't move, mm -hmm. if you just stay still, they'll just ignore you. Well, I think they see pretty good, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but, yeah, they, they ignore you, though, if you don't. Well, well that's, that's a part of their um, evolutionary, their, their behavior. They don't show fear. Uh, so if animals that show fear immediately elicit a response from, from a predator, right? So if you run from a predator, it chases. So with skunks, they've evolved to be bold, right? So they'll walk right up to you. They'll, they'll walk right past you uh, because they have this uh, spray, right? So <laughs> if they're if they're attacked by something, they spray it. But the thing is, they don't have spray all the time. Like I've talked to people who said their dog ran up to the back of a skunk and the skunk didn't do anything. Uh, often they don't have spray. So that's why they have the big tail and the white stripes mm -hmm. because if a coyote runs up and to a skunk and gets sprayed once and then it comes up to another skunk who may be empty, um, they'll see the white tail on the white stripes and they'll it'll leave it alone so uh, just because it's been it's had that experience right so are they a disease vector like rats I know rats can no no rats can carry well like I said like we're not sure about the uh, the bubonic plague but luckily we don't have to worry about that disease too much anymore but they do carry uh, things like uh, um, uh, pneumonia and uh, and uh, what's the other one um, like a hepatitis of some yeah, sort or? there's rat bite fever um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, salmonella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, skunks and raccoons seem to get along. Uh, no, have... actually, skunks and raccoons are the two biggest uh, competitors. Uh, and so, a lot often at night, when you when you smell skunk smell, it's probably it sprayed a, a raccoon. So the skunk was feeding on some worms or whatever on a garden or a lawn, and the raccoon came along. It, often, raccoons will follow the skunks because they know the skunks know where the good food is. And so it'll try to start eating the skunk's food, and the skunk will get annoyed and spray it. Well, we've had skunks and raccoon on our property, and they don't seem to yeah. bother each other. Well, yeah, unless they're competing for directly for a particular food source. I think the message that we're getting from you, loud and clear, though, is to um, you don't we don't want uh, we don't want to put uh, wildlife at risk, and so the the more that we can do to eliminate food sources within the community and keep them in the wild where they need to be the better that's right so yeah so thanks for that yeah carry yeah. on yeah yeah so i mean basically right and and you know if given uh, the right circumstances though numbers will be reduced to a healthy number but we've in nelson kind of unintentionally created a, a perfect uh storm of of new no, 
food and shelter and and uh, so and if proliferation you, of skunks yeah you can't yeah. do much about the water you can't do much about the lawns but you can control the compost and you can control you know the um, the garbage and you can control you know these sort of things mm -hmm. uh, and also possibly control people's you know I mean that's what I try to do is educate people and talk to them like see they got their they got an issue with skunks and I'll talk to them and say you know close your shed door so the skunks can't get in there or clean it up or whatever but thank you yeah you're welcome Oh, that's the end. Oh. That's the end. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, Council. Um, that, that was a really interesting uh, presentation. And I think that the partnership that we have with WildSight has been so successful in terms of educating people to not attract wildlife into, the, into town so that it co comes into conflict with either humans or with domesticated pets. And uh, I, I, it's been, it, I, I know that uh, I've noticed a real difference in the last couple of years, so I'd like to thank you for your hard work as well. Does, is there any other questions from Council regarding any of the information you heard today? Yes, Council Warmington. I have just a quick question about this map. So I'm assuming that the red dots are the rat sightings? That's right, yeah, the little red dots. Are and the stars? Oh, those are just uh, from Google. Oh, <laughs> just Google Earth. Earth. Yeah. Thank you. I just kind of wanted to throw this together. Actually, this is a very current map because I one of the reportings I got was this morning, so I had to throw it together pretty quickly. But which uh, one? Not the one at Hoover. That was the one at uh, Benson and Fifth Street. That's this morning. So, yeah. Oh, mm. I know Hoover's. They're mo They're on the move. They're 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 definitely on the move. I mean, they they grow very quickly. They, they there's only about eight weeks between uh, conception and sexual maturity. From conception to sexual maturity. Yeah. And they can produce five to ten in a litter, and so technically, not always, but technically, if you don't control the uh, attractants, the things, the nutrients, the calories in their system, then uh, they can grow from uh, to a mating pair to a thousand in one year. One year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, most of these reportings, of course, are all fatalities. So I mean, they are being taken out in the system either by cats or getting run over by cars and whatever. So there are. Uh, mortalities, right? Which uh, which re control the numbers, but uh, that's the reason why they have to spread so quick or grow so quickly in numbers. As, so. Uh, all right, uh, go ahead, Councillor Sherbo. So we, uh, my mom lives over near, used to live near Creston, had wood rats, which looked like a big, huge mouse, mm -hmm. short hair and a long, skinny tail. Mm -hmm. Getting sightings of those around here? Yeah, yeah, they're they're around there. That's I think that's a pack rat. Yeah, that's just another name for a pack rat. Well, a pack there's. I guess two different kinds. Do you pack want to take rats that are more furry, mm -hmm. evidently. Yeah. Well, pack rat kind of looks like a rat, but it's got. It's just, the only difference is it's still got the long tail, but the tail is bushy, or has hair on it. This one just had a looked like a big, huge mouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be that probably. I mean, a lot of times it's hard to tell the difference between a rat and a mouse too, except for just by size. Well, this okay. Is like and the tail. All right. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Daly. Mouse on steroids. Vegetable gardens is that an attractant? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, keeping them fenced or whatever, having like a, like a really fine wire mesh around it, um, that would be definitely an attractant. Um, yeah, poultry mesh, poultry netting or poultry mesh is the best way to keep them out because it's like nice small. So for skunks. Oh, for both well, for both, both rats, rats. rats as well. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. The, I mean, the food source for both animals are pretty much similar. You know, okay. I'm not sure if rats, you know, feed on like dig in lawns, lawns and look for. Um, worms and that, but um, but most everything else, garbage and fruit and stuff like that, all is an attractant for both the skunks and the rats. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and a rat too, another thing is to make sure that houses, like one thing I've, I'm trying to, like in the article that went out and when I talk to people is to make sure you go around your house and seal anything larger than a loony, because that's about the size that they can get through. Yeah. They, they have a way of squeezing Squeezing through uh, openings as small as a uh, loony. Mm -hmm. They look quite large. Uh, thank you for that wealth of information. So, <laughs> if people should be uh, spot any of these rats, do they call you? Yeah, yeah. I get and people. you want to, we want to keep, we want to keep track of where they are. Yeah, I mean, we only there. have like seven reportings now, but yeah. I mean, over time, I can kind of develop a bit better of an idea of where their most uh, serious problem is. Uh, and there's people watching today, so you'd like maybe like to give them the phone number for WildSight? Sure, it's 250-505-6007. Uh, or nelson at wildsafebc.com. Thank you. Yep. That was really informative. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> 
All right, on to our next topic, which would be on <laughs> the Nelson Committee on Homelessness and uh, to give us our annual report on, uh, on uh, your report card findings. Please come forward. So we have Anne Harvey and Jenny, are you going to join her? You're just here to observe, okay. No, I'm doing it. Oh, hi. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for the opportunity to report. I know that you have received um, this by email already, so I'm not going to go through the whole <laughs> thing, um, but I would like to just focus on some of the highlights that have to do with some events coming up this fall. Um, so um, I'd also um, like to introduce Tim Oshmansky, who is uh, the current principal at Rosemont Elementary, and I'll a bit more about him in, in a few minutes. So this is the report card that we did put out and as you know every year we um, we do some research on both um, the, a focus once a, a year around an issue of homelessness and track community indicators. This year was the report on a point in time count in April of homeless people who were surveyed and counted. Um, and I'm just going to run through this really quickly. Basically, our vacancy rates are at 0%. The rent, rents keep on climbing, both from C CMHC's indicators and advertised rental rates. Um, in the last two years, especially, one and two bedrooms have climbed by, no, two bedrooms by 25%, and um, studio rents by around 25% in terms of advertised rental rates. CMHC is always a bit less because those are rent controlled units. Mm. Um, and what we noticed uh, was that of the rentals that were being um, advertised, there was an increasing amount of um, ads that looked at shared living situations. And this can often put people in precarious living situations where one person might have the rental contract, but the others will come in but don't really have any status mm. under that. So. Um, it, there's kind of a rise in that and the other big finding was that out of those the majority were single sharing and not families so you have two and three bedroom units which could be rented to families but were being kind of out competed by singles looking searching for affordable housing and, and you know coming together to try and, and meet that affordability need um, the other thing that came out last year was uh, stats Canada income um, information finally and if you look at the bottom there um, well or the top 47 percent of um, Nelson renters pay over 30 percent of their income which was the kind of the CMHC standard for affordability mm -hmm. that's higher than the BC average and um, the median income in Nelson was lower than the BC average and if you look at paying 30 percent of your income then you know there's that affordability gap even for the median income, let alone those who are under that and trying to meet even a one bedroom, um, let alone if you're a family, uh, one bedroom rent. Um, I'm just gonna skip some of this. And the ripple effect then, you know, I mean, we get the ripple effect from the lower mainland coming out here, but the ripple effect from Nelson is that people are moving elsewhere to try and attain affordability. And um, there's, we saw that, we did a, a rental review in kind of the region and saw that rents were climbing elsewhere as well. So um, there's, what that means is increased um, pressure on transportation systems, so people have to work or get to services or appointments and things like that. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, three bedrooms are really scarce mm -hmm. for rentals. Um, yeah, so those are some of the major findings. The, the two main issues we did had coming out of the point in time homeless count were the amount of people in precarious living situations. Like we approached around 700 some odd people, 360 or so answered um, a question which was kind of a pre-screening question which meant they weren't homeless, but we asked them, well, what's your current housing situation? If, you know, if you rent, what's your current housing situation <coughs> like? And a third of those people, 107, um, with housing indicated that their current housing situation was at risk um, for those per, uh, reasons noted, either conflict or abuse with a parent or a guardian or a spouse. <coughs> and, 
that was about 34% equally. Uh, tenancy issues around either unsafe housing or room, roommate or landlord conflicts. 24% had financial challenges to try and pay the rent or upcoming job loss or something like that. And uh, about 23% had health challenges in terms of trying. And these were people that, oh, I'm kind of a little worried. No, this, these are, I'm worried I might lose my housing within the next month or two. So um, it, it kind of stood out for us as a finding. And the second um, kind of main aha for us was around youth homelessness. And that's the reason I'm really talking to you t today is because um, this was something that um, the committee took note of and, and is trying to address further through some of the work through what we're doing and what uh, our member organizations are doing in the community as well. So what we found is 56% um, of all ages of respondents who were experiencing some kind of homelessness, that is 101 who were actually surveyed, not as well counted, but actually surveyed, said that their first experience of homelessness happened before they were 19 years of age. And this is a finding that's kind of um, rippled across Canada too as more youth counts take place with a increasing understanding in the homelessness sector that the earlier one can get to look at family stability, at issues <coughs> that put youth at risk, the sooner those things can be addressed, then the sooner, you know, the, the more impact there is in terms of homeless populations and, and health. And 54% of the youth respondents were under 25 years of age had indicated they'd been in foster care or group homes. Mm -hmm. And this is another major finding that's consistent with what's being found across the country as well. Um, and of all respondents, 32% were youth. So all of these figures stood out to us as, hmm, okay, this is something we should be looking at. Um, some of it might have been due to the methodology because we did want to try and capture what youth homelessness looked like. So we kind of went out of our way to see where could they be, how can we count them, but still it's significant. And, this, and the percentage of 32% in the count of youth uh, being youth out of all of the 101 counted or uh, surveyed was a higher percentage than in most other um, places in BC too. Um, of the youth respondents who were experiencing homelessness, 43% indicated the number one factor and this was understandable would be a conflict with a parent or guardian. Interestingly, the same percentage said identified as LGBTQ or uh, two-spirited. 93% um, said that the number one barrier they had in finding stable housing was high rents or other um, economic factors like low incomes or not enough affordable housing. Um, they identified their top service needs and we put, there's kind of a standard um, uh, survey across Canada you can add, we added local questions and some of these factors came out with the local questions that, that or answered options that we added and they were around dental care, uh, mental health services, tenant information and supports like how can I rent, how should I be a good tenant but uh, you know I'm having problems how can I deal with it. I care in glasses and temporary work, the need for temporary work because if you're in a if you're in a precarious living situation, if you're homeless, if you're couch surfing from place to place, because a lot of these kids are hidden homeless, um, staying at, at friends, moving then to a family member, back to friends, maybe in the shelter for a while, back to a friend. So it's very cyclical kind of that way. It's really hard to um, both maintain education and, and maintain work as well. Mm -hmm. So temporary work opportunities can be really important. Um, and then top barrier to accessing services were either they couldn't afford them um, uh, or tra transportation trying to get to these services. Um, at this point I'd like to introduce again Tim Mushmansky. Um He has graciously accepted being our honorary chair this year for Homeless Action Week. And part of the reason we asked is because um, there's also a growing understanding in the homeless sector that schools play a really vital role. Mm. And maybe I can, um, and we are, so 
maybe I'll get you to talk a bit about what's being planned. Following up on the report card, we always like to have a focus for Homeless Action Week, which is coming up. And uh, Tim would want to maybe speak about that and a bit of why he's interested in this topic this sure. year. Can I sit there for the microphone? Yeah. I don't know if I need to have. So thank you for having me. Um, I was kind of surprised when I got the invitation to uh, chair this group, honorary chair. I think honorary chair means you don't have to do very much. You just look pretty sometimes. Um, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to actually dive in. Uh, my background is in education. I've been an educator for 24 years. I've been an administrator in this school district for 12 years almost, coming up. And uh, I was a vice principal at LVR for eight and a half of those years. And as a teacher, uh, uh, you mentioned the, the hidden homeless. And uh, that was really something that is so very true. As a classroom teacher, I had no clue which one of these kids was couch surfing or which one of these kids didn't have that support or which one was having that conflict with parents or whatever. And when I got to that administration level, I really found out a lot of them. And a lot of them, you would never pick them out of the crowd. The one that presented them so well, it seemed like they had everything together, that was often the one that, you know what, there's something going on there with that kid that we would find out but they didn't want their teachers, they didn't want their peers, their peers that they found out that was, that was uh, horrible for them. So uh, I jumped on the opportunity to, to join this group and uh, I'm really passionate about uh, helping families and helping kids out. And uh, I thought I would kind of leave that at the, element, or at the secondary level when I moved into a principalship at Rosemont Elementary, but it was quite the opposite. The number of families that we support, that we work on to actually help them find housing uh, support the kids to feed them to do what we can um, is um, really important and sometimes overwhelming so uh, I'm really honored to be here um, I like uh, the name of it this is the homeless action week uh, and it implies that we actually need to do something that uh, learning about it is important right the Stephen Covey right uh, seek first to understand is great but I think we actually need to do something about it and so I'm challenging myself, I'm challenging my colleagues in the school district, and I hope that you're challenging each other and challenging yourself to do something. Uh, and that could be participating in, in what we've got planned here. So Catherine McParland is coming to uh, Nelson. Uh, she's a, a great advocate of uh, youth homeless issues. Uh, and I love the quote that we have on the poster. I don't know if you've seen this yet. Uh, I think we've got copies for you. Um, with lived experience, she has turned the concept of homelessness youth on its head. Here's the part to pay attention to. She has inspired landlords, business owners, university, and provincial, municipal, federal governments to open their eyes to the financial and social cost of ignoring homeless youth. And so I really resist the, the notion to boil this down to it's going to cost money in the end or it's going to cost us, but I think it costs us as a society. And I see that. I see that in our schools. And so that's one of the reasons I'm involved. So um, Homeless Action Week takes place uh, kicking off October 8th at our, our Daily Bread, I believe. If I can read this, I need glasses, oh my gosh. Uh, Kootenai Christian Fellowship, 520 Hall Street on October 8th for 5 p.m. I'm going to drag my whole family down and we're going to serve dinner. And that's uh, a Thanksgiving dinner kickoff Monday for that week. I can't wait to see what my teenage children think about that, but too bad. Um, and then we have a public forum planned for October 10th at 5 p.m. at the Adventure Hotel. And one of the actions that you can take as a council is you can show up and you can listen and then you can figure out what you can do at your level to help with that issue in our society. And I'm sure in the election you're going to hear about issues around homelessness and do you have any spare change? Do you have something that can help us out? Right. And so this is an opportunity for you to... Uh, to figure out how you can uh, be a part of that solution um, and uh, help out. I think that's all I got to say. Okay. Maybe I'll just add that um, I'm passing around a little flyer on the, it's October 5th at 5, as you said, mm -hmm. at the Adventure um, Hotel Ballroom. Um, and I'm just passing hard copies of the report around if you'd like one. If you don't, we'll take them back. But I know you have an email copy, but um, in that is the letter that you were also sent by the chairs of the com um, Nelson Committee on Homelessness, just uh, challenging citizens in Nelson as a whole to uh, think about what they can do to help address some of the issues. Um, and um, I know Council has a particular um, concern around um, affordable housing, 
can the work it does on the housing committee and, um, and so it has a you know there's a real um, need I think to um, look at um, at risk and um, in precarious living situations in town and uh, kind of a demand for some kind of stability around housing so if and when projects come forward we would urge your support of them around this and maybe some facilitation or even leadership in terms of uh, helping to bring partners together because you have a, 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 <coughs> an, a unique role uh, in terms of kind of arm's length um, ability to know the community and to bring different actors together to maybe make things happen. So that's always, uh, we're not saying uh, foot the bill, we're saying, you know, <laughs> help the um, uh, partners, the community partners in helping to address these kinds of housing needs in the city. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, Jenny, if you had anything to add. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Right, so I guess that's, that's kind of it. Uh, maybe I just want to say a bit about Catherine McParland because we're so lucky to have her. This is a woman who herself lived about 12 years in foster care from home to eight different um, um, foster home situations, was homeless, experienced homelessness several times, finally landed in the right place with the right support, got her life together, went on to take a social work degree, and has become a champion, really, of the youth homelessness issue around the province. She is the founder of a way home in Kamloops, um, which is... Uh, which, whose name and actual approach to, uh, as a community movement of addressing youth homelessness has been embraced both nationally and internationally. She uh, is now the co-chair of the BC Coalition to End Youth Homelessness. She has sat on the National Advisory Committee on Homelessness. She is a BC Housing Commissioner. Um, and she has a passion in trying to address this issue and speaks from lived experience. So. Um, we're really lucky to have her. She's a dynamic uh, personality, and um, she will be giving both a presentation and then helping to facilitate some discussion as well that evening. So we really hope you can come and um, be, be part of that. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. Go ahead, Councillor Purcell. I was wondering, with your looking at this particular issue of youth homelessness, we've been hearing a lot about um, uh, young people who age out of care and suddenly find themselves with... Uh, inadequate support to, and, and you know, you just uh, pointed out in the slide that a significant number of the, of the youth homeless were at one point wards of the state. And is that something that you are in learning about as well in your work you did for the report card? Yes, as is the provincial government. I mean, there's a relatively new provincial government as well, and they've taken this issue seriously. Um, uh, there have been some initial improvements in terms of extending some supports for, uh, to older, um, I think it's 26 now, is it? I'm not sure, yeah. Um, some types of support as well as offering free tuition for any youth who's been in care in BC uh, for university. Um, but part of Catherine McParland's initiative, actually, she's working um, in uh, partnership with the office representative for children and youth if you know that's the kind of <coughs> arm's length office uh, that is kind of the watchdog on what the, the province does in terms of children and youth. And we're lucky enough to have the minister just next door from Castlegar actually, who is passionate about these issues too. So I think they're really trying to work on it and I think the, the Catherine has held um, youth forums with the office uh, representative of children and youth <coughs> around the province about 19 of them, I think. Nelson's was the last one. That, so this is coming with a bit of momentum, too, because on September 11th, there was a youth forum in Nelson, which was facilitated by Catherine McFarland. Mm -hmm. It had an excellent turnout. They, the people from the office said they were blown away by the articulateness of the youth in mm -hmm. Nelson. And these are homeless youth. These, mm -hmm. aren't any, you know, these are all people who had experienced homelessness uh, youth. and. Um, they have held these throughout the province, and they're trying to really. Catherine's leading the way in trying to the development of a to develop a new provincial plan on how to address this issue. Great. 
as well, um, the Nelson Community Services is getting together with MCFD, uh, kind of a long planned workshop for a day and uh, the week before mm -hmm. Catherine comes on the 11th. They're getting together on the 4th, I think, and are looking at how can we work better together? How can we communicate better? Mm -hmm. What do we envision, you know, in terms of some of the gaps right now and how we can close those? So there's a lot happening. There's a lot of momentum in the community. Mm -hmm. And we're excited about that because that will help enhance the discussions we have on the board as well. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Yes, Councilor Sherbo. As we know, uh, Nelson Karras has got their project down at Lakeside, and Jim Reimer's project by his place. Will that alleviate some of the homelessness, do you think? Um, well, I think it will help because it's like mixed income units. Well, um, I, think, I think I'd like Jenny to talk a bit about Lakeside because you know, and it's specifically around Lakeside is seniors and people yeah. with disabilities. Um, I think um, the Quitney Christian Fellowship project is around singles housing, which, you know, could help. But again, those were under programs that were paid, the capital was paid for, but not necessarily the operating costs. And mm -hmm. that's always the issue uh, going forward in the long term, too. Um, and the, as you know, building costs have shot up over the last three years incredibly so it's a, it's still a challenge and we're still looking for ways senior level governments can help right now. Yeah. I, mean, I can make a quick comment. Yeah. So uh, the 2014 housing Yeah, the pressure has increased intensely over the last two or three years. So. Okay. Any other questions, Council? We'll look forward to that. Uh, uh, the event that you've uh, shared with us, that sounds like it'll be a good event. And congratulations for being consenting to be the honorary chair. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, an, it's important work. Uh, we hear about uh, housing needs consistently at council level and uh, we do uh, we we do meet with ministers we've met, we meet with developers and we're looking at um, our housing uh, development development policies as well that'll be coming up next uh, next for next council to refine and figure out how we can uh, develop more more units on the on the ground when developments are going through so yeah, Thank I, th you. I think it is probably time to relook at that because it's yeah, so it's old time. Now, so yeah. And yeah. so much has happened in between. It's, uh, yeah, we'll be looking at that yeah. and looking at how how to bring people on that that can provide units. It's something that's been really difficult, as you identified in your report. It's so it's difficult to um, provide affordability when it's when it's so expensive to build here. It's more expensive to build here than mm -hmm. elsewhere, yeah. and uh, that's a big issue. So every time we have the opportunity to redevelop existing sites or add to them. Uh, I know that I know Lakeside is a it's a big a big job, but I'm glad that we're redeveloping a site and, and adding density there that uh, will really help in this issue. One of the projects that we have been looking and and trying to attract developers with, as you are aware, around and could be specifically around uh, additional youth housing, is on top of the youth center. We haven't had any bites yet, so there you go. Anyway. Thanks. Uh, we'll keep working at that. Thanks for your presentation today, and I know we'll be hearing more. Yeah, maybe we could form a city committee about how we might pursue that. 
Well, we have a committee. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if we need another one, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We, we, need, we need developers. Yeah. Thanks very much. All right. Appreciate your time. Yeah, you too. Appreciate your time as well. Thanks for coming today. All right. Um, let's uh, hear from our Vernon Street development. No, I, I just I thought Kelowna one was thinking about it. I have to pick Eric up at 3.30. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, please, please come forward. Hi. We'll probably be done. <clears throat> I'm not sure what you guys have received yet for any information, but I was told that maybe it would be a good idea to print off. Uh, That'd be great. For you guys, you can take some notes. This is basically just my PowerPoint presentation. Okay. And you guys can maybe take Thank some you. notes and if there's questions. I know this project is uh, <clears throat> is significant enough to sort of cap capture it in, in 10 or 15 minutes is going to be difficult, but at least uh, uh, get us started here. Once again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Start building. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm controlling this PowerPoint, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> and it's the left click? Uh, the up and down arrow keys actually work better than the mouse. Oh, okay. Great. Good stuff. Um, thanks for taking the time to, uh, uh, and allowing us to come in here and introduce our project. Uh, we had a couple of of goals in mind here really to to introduce you guys and give you a taste or a little flavor of where we're going with our proposed development which is uh, currently in uh, in the development permit process with the city planning department um, I wanted to basically introduce the team that we have uh, provide an understanding a general understanding of our project I know it's this project as we flip through and you look at some of the photos that I put in here um, it's a lot more comprehensive than just five or six or ten photographs that we've sort of provided for you guys here because there's a lot of services provided within the facility and um, and uh, a lot of details will go with it. So there's also some variances that I wanted to bring to your attention. So um, so those are the basically the three three uh, most uh, most important factors here. Just introduce the team, provide the understanding, and give you guys a heads up. Um, our business uh, is is vendor retirement communities, and uh, we're focusing on secondary communities. Uh, with, that uh, with along with our feasibility consultant, we're trying to identify markets where. Um, there's a shortage or a strong demand for for seniors housing uh, we're specifically looking more towards the assisted living models uh, where there's care there's care services on top of the comfort services that are typically provided in uh, independent living facilities um, and what we're doing is we're trying to create more of a resort resort style active living uh, model for for the seniors to to uh, live in um, our, our development team uh, is consists of ourselves, Vendor, and GTA Architects, who we work with. I have a long track uh, track record in history with, and uh, and our rollout model was uh, it was completed about three years ago uh, in Salmon Arm. We had a 75 bed facility that was completed there. It is up and running and successful and full with a waiting list. So the model that we we started we launched off with is very successful and it works. So. Um, uh, and, and GTA Architects, or Gary Tomparowski, based out of Kelowna, as we are, um, brings about 25, 30 years plus experience in multifamily care home and commercial development. Uh, on the operations side of our, our business, which is essentially what happens after we, we can finish developing the facility and we, we open it up for business, uh, we've got MJ Milner Consulting, who happens to be a local uh, nurse here in Nelson, um, she's uh, an op acts as our operations director and uh, as, a, as a third party consultant as well as we're, we're putting in our, our policies and procedures and getting the, the, the facility staffed up and getting our operator uh, under control and out of, the, out of the gates. And our operating partner is Advocare Health Services, uh, again based out of Kelowna with numerous facilities across, operating numerous facilities across uh, BC, out in the Kootenays, Lower Mainland and in the Okanagan. Uh, everybody with with a fairly deep uh, wealth of depth and experience in the uh, uh, development, um, business startup, operations, et cetera. Um, just to be clear, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to get the message across today is that we are assisted living. Uh, we, are, we are regulated by the BC Registrar, which is the ministry, through the, the, the BC government and the BC Seniors Living Association. So we're not, we are a fully private, Enterprise, uh, we're not subsidized by BC Housing or anything else, and um, 
I just wanted to sort of separate that from uh, adult living, which is questions that have come up in the past when we're dealing with people with adult living, what's our minimum age? We are, we are regulated by the uh, BC Registrar and, um, and we provide a minimum amount of services, which I'll touch on a little bit here, so. <clears throat> we should be flipping these along as I'm going along. So those are the, the uh, three topics that I just went through is the opportunities that, that we identify, which we've identified in the, um, with a strong demand for uh, a need for seniors housing in the market that we're targeting. Uh, our development team and our operations team. Uh, well, I just wanted to highlight here, you're, you're probably asking, well, what does that mean? Uh, you're identifying our market. Where are you getting these numbers? What, is, what kind of numbers? You've got a facility coming here, uh, which I'll touch in a little bit, but we've got 125 beds that we're proposing here for Nelson. It sounds like a fairly significant facility and number of beds. And so as a, as a business model, we look at a minimum amount of beds that make it worthwhile in, in creating a facility of this nature with the services that we provide. There's a minimum uh, amount of beds to supply that infrastructure that goes into place for that. So I just wanted to touch here as you're asking, well, what does that mean? Um, we've had a, a third, bullet, third party feasibility study done. Um, they went through and they've, they've done an extensive investigation on the, on the market in this area here that included uh, Nelson Trail and Castlegar. And there's, I think, a 40 kilometer radius around that. So that, that's the, the capturement area of all the people that would be looking for homes. And you can see here in 2016 through to 2021, and I've, I've th shown all those years because it's about a two year project here for this thing to actually open the doors. Once we get through all the permitting process, then we've got a, about a year and a half to 18 months worth of construction taking place. And um, so just looking at those numbers in there, um, you can kind of extrapolate that we're gonna be in the neighborhood of 850 people, seniors, looking for some form of housing what we're, where we're targeting our market on. So, um, and usually what the, the no-go no or go on this is that um, it's if every three, every two people looking, there's one bed provided. So if it's, a, if it's that, if you can, once that, that point is hit, it's called the DCR ratio. Once you find that 2.0, if there's two people looking for one bed, then you decide as a business, so this is the way we're gonna go. It's the market is ripe and we need to go to <clears throat> that market. So, and as you can see here, uh, we're, if we're providing 125 beds, there's a demand roughly in 2020 of 850 people looking for some form of, of, of home care or facility care. So, um, yes, there's, there's, it's based on age. Um, I've been asked in the past, what is, what is the minimum age of your facility? I don't think there's actually a formal number out there. Uh, I think if we all just thought back 20 or 30 years ago, a senior was probably somebody that was 65. That's, that's a, doesn't even, it's not even in existence anymore. Um, what we find in our home uh, in, in Salmon Arms, I think our minimum age is like 80. Mm -hmm. um, people are living longer, they have healthier lifestyles, they're more active, and we promote that in our facilities as you'll see <clears throat> when I move to the, to the drawings that, that are coming up here, so. An average age is 80 or? Average age is a lot higher. Oh, is it? Yeah. Um, an 80-year-old in our facility is a fairly active person. Um, it, it's probably in the higher 80s. Okay. That, that probably is the average age. And then I, I just indicated the map where we landed. Uh, we've been working with a local realtor here, and we've, we've we came and we've uh, researched the market here in, Cal in Castle Gar and here. Uh, we came up with a number of properties that we were looking at, and this one jumped out at us as number one right away, just given the location. Uh, some of the things that, that seniors look for is just accessibility <laughs> to services. Uh, although we do provide things like shuttle services and things like that uh, by week, or twice a week to help them out with uh, appointments and things like that. Um, they're looking to get out and walk the streets, do some shopping, walk their pets, whatever, whatever the case may be. So we, as soon as we spotted that location, we thought this was, was, was prime. It's already zoned for the application that we wanna use it for. So uh, it sort of hit home, and so we went home and, uh, and we crunched the numbers on it and said, can we make this work? Contact our, contacted our, uh, our architect, ran some quick numbers, contacted the city, met, uh, met with the planners here, and things seemed to be in line with the direction that we wanted to go and what the market needed. <clears throat> 
So just to extend a little bit on our services and amenities that we're proposing for, for the market that we're targeting and the facility that we're coming up with here now, um, we basically separated into two forms of services. Um, I've got it down, it's probably a little bit backwards here, but I've got care service and comfort services this is really what we offer. And so the care services are more of a fee for, fee for service, they're assisted living. Um, that's the regulated portion, the, the higher regulated portion of our, of our, our, um, our business. And those five bullets that are on there are mandatory and regulated items that go through the, care, the assisted living act. So I believe it's that we have to have a minimum of three of those in order to be uh, registered as an assisted living facility. Uh, for which we will be registering this facility for is assisted living. And then the comfort services are, are basically the amenities and services that are, are uh, included in, in our facility. Um, they may be services um, and or amenities that we have like gyms, a billiards room, a bistro, um, all, all things that enhance the, the lifestyle. The old days of well, when my grandfather was in a, in a golden age club, I think they played some lawn bowling and that was about all they had. And so um, the expectations of seniors coming through now is, is, is a one-stop shop. They want to move into some place. Um, they, have, they pay their rent. Uh, on another note, this is a lease. It's not a for sale. It's, not a, it's not, um, um, going to be sold off as individual units. So uh, they move in and they want to basically have a one-stop shop. They're fed. The meals are included. There's, there's a minimum amount of laundry services. Um, games, uh, we, we revolve around the activities of, of our uh, seniors. Uh, we also did some research and we follow what's, what's very commonly known out there in the, the seniors care home world is the Eden model of care, which, is, which was derived out of Europe. It was a psychologist of seniors that uh, came up with this Eden model of care. Talks about the things like the colors and, and the environment that seniors are around, lighting, uh, pet friendly, things like that. And we've, we try to follow that as much as possible or we adopted that. So you can see in there that in the comfort services, it's, this facility is, it almost is like an all inclusive resort. Um, once, once you're in there, the only reason why you're leaving, and given this facility that we have some commercial space designation, which I'll touch on, they may not have to leave if we're able to connect with the community, uh, maybe get some GPs or some, um, some therapists or something in our commercial space that we can these people, are, they're, they're looked after in their own backyard or their home. So um, if there's any questions on any of those particular services, um, you know, we could, as we wrap through, I know I'm, I'm going to speed through this here. Again, I, I reiterate this. Sorry, go ahead. But just a couple of quick questions. Is there going to be, would there be couples as well? Yes, yes. And are there any units with kitchens or, or not? Good question. Um, in, in the care home world, I, I believe the short answer right now will be yes. If I had my choice, I'd say no, um, because it's, it's a liability to have stoves and it, basically stoves in, in units. So if people you know, want to do some muffin, cooking at nine o'clock at night, fall asleep, and there's a liability with fire. Uh, that being said, um, we probably will include that. That's something that we're gonna review with our, with our operator. Whether we, didn't, we did not have them in our last one. We had two burner cooktop units. They have kitchenettes with, a, with an apartment size, for like a three quarter size fridge, uh, convection microwave uh, oven. And then we offered the two burner cooktops and they have a sink and so it's a, it's a kitchenette. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have to as we get through the next next portion of our, our permitting, we're gonna have to nail down whether or not we go down that direction or not. If it came from my own decision, um, it'd probably be no. But it's really it, we're gonna have to see what the community pushes towards. Um, if they, if, and again, it's not a, a major issue. It's not a cost issue. More of a safety issue for us. And and the staff requirement for a project like this size? We're gonna be pushing somewhere in that 90. Uh, 90 um, Mainly people for full and part time. Okay, and the units are going to be for people who can afford it. It's going to be this. This correct at this point in time, it's fully private. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, and, and and thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, we we will be looking at approximately ninety full part time uh, positions being filled in there. That includes nurses to nurse, nurse aides, multi service workers, chefs, maintenance people. Um, you said you were zoned for what you want. Is that mixed use residential or institutional or what's care it? home? Okay. Care right. home and and given the zoning that it is, we have to have a certain amount on the main floor of, of commercial space. Commercial space. Uh, okay. I, I shouldn't say commercial, non-residential. Right. Um, I see the planners are here, so you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's non-residential, which we're looking at as some form of commercial professional. 
So whether it's a pharmacy, whether it's doctor's offices. Sure, no, I was just wondering, is it C, like, I, just, I don't know. Do you remember what the zoning actually is for C1? the lane? C1. Um, I can I can go on with the services so please jump in again I can I can I can go on forever and we can we can talk and I can yammer on about all the services and how no but uh, please, please all the proceed with your presentation I think, okay I think we can move on okay thank you um, so I'm gonna just scroll through here this is this is the concept that we've come come to here working with the planning departments uh, this is the front street uh, that that elevation that you're seeing on the top of that that picture there um, is probably not an elevation that anybody's going to really appreciate or see when it's actually in place. And you'll see in the next slide, we try to incorporate more of a street view of what this facility is going to look. But it's four stories above Vernon Street grade uh, with the main story along Vernon Street as, as uh, commercial or non-residential. So it's going to be commercial retail uh, professional of some nature. Um, we haven't subleased anything out yet, so it's, it's open, but there's four just under 4,000 square feet of commercial space that's going to be available there. So uh, once we're through our development permit and we know that the project is, uh, is going to move ahead as, as it's planned, uh, we'll certainly be looking at filling that in. So it gives a couple of, uh, it gives a couple of uh, views there of, of different angles, and I'll scroll to the next photographs of what that building's going to look from the outside. Um, just keep in mind that we are working very closely with the planning department to make sure that we do fit in with the bylaw requirements, so the form and characters. Um, and that all being said, we always welcome, we welcome comments on the, on the design of the facility because we want it to be a complement to the community, we don't want some big institutional eyesore plunked down in the middle of, of, of uh, Main Street, so to speak, and in, in, in a very important location in the city of Nelson. So um, this is where we've landed. We've been back and forth a couple of times on it. We've had some great comments come back from the planning department, which we've been making some small small changes on here just to make sure that it fits within, within everybody's expectations and the guidelines of the OCP. And this one here is just, is trying to incorporate, we just took a, off of Google, our architect tried to incorporate that plan into uh, what that facility is going to look like if you were standing down in the street driving by. So, are there any, any comments or questions before I flip through that? And all good there. Um, again, all the setbacks, the step ups, the step backs on the, on the top of the building, these are all, these are all in compliance with uh, the design codes through the, through the uh, city. Um, this is looking from the from the back side of the facility, which uh, we feel is as important on the back as it is on the front of the building. <laughs> um, the back side of this facility is going to be visible from from down in the valley, but they also have views and and these these are these are the residents' homes, and we want them to be proud of where they're at. Um, you know, a lot of complications that come with with seniors' housing is that they're they're institutional, depressing, and and not places where seniors can thrive in. And so we really are working towards the act of lifestyle and you'll you can kind of capture here uh, does this thing have a mouse it does we have I, I wrote in here actually three exterior courtyards and one rooftop um, my partner corrected me on the way down here but in between these fingers that if, if you can follow my mouse there in between there um, and, and on this main floor in between in the middle finger that's our dining area and our, our, our lounge and sort of our common area where we congregation of people eat and on both sides of that where did my mouse go? There we are. On both sides, on this side and that side, it has access so that the, that feeling, um, because it is, we, we are putting as much density as we can. That's, that's what we're trying to accomplish on here, but also trying to give some form of an active lifestyle and, 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 and perception of openness through there. So that will all be open, especially in the summertime, those will be open so that people can travel right through. There's a courtyard that'll just, it'll be basically, I think those are 20 feet wide in between the fingers there. Uh, in the spaces and then there's the building itself so it's, it's going to be quite wide open and we'll have uh, vegetation that we're going to incorporate landscaping on site um, because we don't have acres of land here we're going to really look at incorporating landscaping within within the facility boundaries and on top of the on top of the facility you can just barely see the the the, the trellis that's up top there we have that one one wing if you want to call it um, is going to be a rooftop courtyard and activities area up top. So we're going to have things like long bowling. Um, uh, I can't remember some of the other names. We're going to have uh, elevated gardens up there because that's very uh, very popular with people. We are pet friendly, so we're going to incorporate that. We want it to be outside as much as they can, so we're, we're incorporating that. In our last facility, and, and, and just as a side note, if anybody wants to sort of see uh, what we've done in the past, I can either direct you to our website for the other facility that we have, which is on three acres of property. 
Um, and we had the luxury of putting horseshoe pits and dog runs and, and stuff out there. It was fantastic and people, but it, the, the downside of it was is that it was a little further out. It was in a residential suburban uh, community. So probably the only downside of that facility is that people complained the fact that we had to actually, they had to bus in to go downtown and do any shopping or anything what like community that. community is that in? Salmon Arm. Okay. So, and I, I'm more than happy to share that one. And our website, I think, is actually on the back. So if you go through to our website, there's a link that will take you there. So, um, so it's a little different. We're, we're really excited about this one. It takes us, because one of the biggest complaints that we had, or the only complaint we really had in our last facility is that we were too far away from, to walk across the street and grab a coffee or, or do any shopping. Um, although, it, again, it's one of those illusions, of, like the stove was in, in the suites. Um, a lot of people want to have that access, but I don't think it really happens, and especially in a facility like this when you're all-inclusive, so to speak. Uh, there's very little reason other than to get a little exercise and go for a walk, and I think, uh, depending on everybody's, you know, everybody's different, but uh, going for a walk on a nice calm pathway somewhere is probably a little more peaceful than, than uh, battling traffic downtown, but um, uh, it, it's, 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 I guess, probably a 50-50 splitter. It's all up to the individual of, of what it is, but active living means being outside, so. Uh, and I don't know if you can, uh, this is a terrible, I, did, I thought maybe on the screen, the big screen, it might show up better. Um, I just kind of wanted to show you the footprints of the building. Um, uh, basically running the, the plans from, from the bottom to the top. So this, this one here that I have my cursor on right now, we have underground, it's, it's, so this, the building actually goes two stories below Vernon Street and four stories above Vernon Street. That hole, as you can see, if, if you know, if everybody's familiar with the 600 block is quite deep, mm -hmm. deeper than what we need to be honest with you. And at one point in time, we were actually uh, uh, had a quick chat about whether or not we were gonna put a second level of parking in there that the city may or may not be interested in and that didn't work out. That being said, what we've done is we've, we've done that level of parking and we've put, so the interior parking we've kept in uh, is, is uh, secured and safe parking for the seniors. Uh, we do have, and it's hard to depict on this drawing here, but along the whole back side of the building is, is park, parking access to the public and it's covered. So that'll be available out on the back end there. Uh, which will bring me up to the part of the variance that we're gonna talk about a little later, but we, you'll see it's, Oh yeah, you'll see it on the next drawing here. I'll show it to you here. But um, there's, a, there's a level of parking along the back alley there where we clean that up. And rather than just putting a retaining wall and carrying our building out there, we've actually uh, put some parking back there so that it has some benefit for, for the public. Um, the next level, if you follow that picture down to the next one, that's the level where I was talking about with, uh, with our dining. That's basically our common shared features. Uh, we have some residentials in each one of those two wings. But along the back side of the building where we're butting up against Vernon Street, that's where we have our commercial services that are in-house services for our, our, our residents. So we have our kitchen, our commercial kitchen. We have a theater, and I, and I don't have it all labeled in here. We have a theater, we have a gym. Um, we have manager suites back there. We have a hair, uh, we're gonna have a hair salon. Um, most of those features where we don't need a lot of natural light or back, we don't need natural light in our kitchen. So, and then as we move out, that's that middle finger that I was explaining to you. That's where our dining, and you can see the seating in there. And then outside is our courtyards on either side, which is basically turns into, and especially in the summertime, is one big common area where it allows people a lot of movement around there. So uh, residentials on, residences on each side. And so majority of our common, our common space and, and, and amenities is on this floor. As you bump down the picture, um, along Vernon Street, which is up on the top side of that photo. Um, that's where our commercial space is that I was talking about. So we have our commercial amenities that's gonna be uh, public, public retail, uh, professional, um, professional or, or uh, commercial services. And on, on the opposite side, we have, we're back into our, our residential, uh, resi residential suites again here. And that is above that, that lower level, which overlooks when you're on these levels. This, this level, uh, moving up to the top right, and then the one below that, those are our typical, that's our levels three and four, um, which is, is strictly residential. That's uh, full residential on those, uh, those two levels. And then, then, of course, you can see, and I, I talked about that court, the uh, rooftop courtyard. We have our roof up top, uh, a courtyard with an elevator access to that. Um, some of the things that we've, we've touched, we're looking into uh, that came up with... Um, with the planning department and we're always looking for, for, for new ideas and great ideas and ingenuity in our, ingenuity in our facilities, but uh, we're considering things like solar energy or exploring that right now. 
Um, the, the topic of, uh, of parking came up and then the next topic of like car share, I believe is what it's called here in town, which I thought was an amazing idea because uh, rather than our, uh, one in three or one in four seniors actually have a vehicle and they don't use them and to have the maintenance and costs associated with that, if, if, if we're, that's something that I was just delighted to hear. I thought it was a great idea, so we're going to explore that. So the building will be used, uh, will be designed and constructed. As, it will not be green built, but it will be utilizing as much uh, efficient and, uh, and energy friendly uh, or environmentally friendly uh, products and, and, uh, and, and design features like light shading and light harvesting and things like that. Uh, again, if you, if once you go onto our salmon arm project, you'll see that those exact same things were implemented on that facility where we had light harvesting. Um, in that one, we did not go to any type of solar, but we did, uh, we did go all uh, LED lighting and things like that. We worked with the hydro to make sure that we were uh, heading down the right path and on all levels as far as this is environmental responsibility as far and, and as well as just um, drive keeping the cost down on operating. Um, so that really wraps up in a nutshell. Uh, again, I can't emphasize enough. It's, it's a, a very, um, this is a, a fairly significant project with a lot of moving pieces in there. And uh, I've, I've screamed over that with those, with those elevation drawings. And um, I just wanted to touch really quickly because the, I, I believe, if I understand the process correctly with the City of Nelson, is that these variances will be coming across your desk at some point between now and, and the October 9th, I believe it was, date. Uh, something of that nature and so uh, I just wanted to sort of show you the two variances that we're we're going to be working on with the with the city we've been in discussions with it in the past um, and just give you a heads up as this is the head the path that we're heading down here so this is the, the cross section of course on on our, our building um, I just wanted to kind of jump down here we talked about the parking here so we have the parking that is kind of cut down below the the the, the bottom elevation of our building here and it's set down lower so that it's uh, more in continuity with the back alley so that you can directly access the parking from the alley. Um, so the reason why I bring that topic up is, is we're looking at some, one of the variances that we're looking at is a height variance. Now we fit, we, we conform and fit within the height uh, requirements along Vernon Street. Uh, there's a 16 meter allowance that we've highlighted on there and we've shown the actual height of our building which which is the where the the guidelines were set to for the, the height measurements. Um, we just showed, uh, oh, it, it, we depicted, I guess the, one of the latest developments you guys had, or one of the later developments you had was the Nelson Commons down the street from us there, which this just sort of gives an idea of where we sit and range to um, other things that have been happening around town here. We, the reason why the height variance comes in is because along the back, we're actually, uh, I think it's somewhere up to 18 and a half meters from the top of our building down to the back, the bottom of that alley. Um, we can avoid that by doing some other things with our building, i.e. get rid of the parking and bringing up uh, retaining walls and just set our building elevation at a higher level, but doesn't really do anybody any good. Um, so we thought, let's try to squeeze as much parking along the back of the, the, back of the building and somebody gets an advantage out of it. So um, uh, what else can I show you on that one? I think that's self-explanatory enough and you guys have all have copies of that. So uh, is there any, anything that anybody wants to sort of touch on or questions on that one? All right, Council, I'll, uh, I'll uh, start a speaking order here. So we've got Councillor Sherbo and we've got Councillor Daly, and we'll start with that. Yeah, it looks very impressive, so thank you for bringing it to us. Uh, it just seems to, the only thing that seems odd is the depth of that hole. It seems deeper than what your drawing shows. The depth of the hole sheet? Yeah, like from, from Vernon Street down to the bottom of, of the hole, it looks like it's probably 13 meters at least, so I'm not sure if I'm looking at this wrong. Well, and I and I don't. Uh, I'm trying to follow that existing ground, which is the gray area along the bottom there. Yeah, that doesn't seem quite so right. So it, it does. It does. It doesn't look. And I've said the same thing because when you drive out there and you're going, I don't remember it being that sloped and that kind of things happening out there, but it does. And as you get to the back of the property, there's actually a fairly significant drop off on the back of that property that happens from the from the property down to the back alley. There's probably a I don't, know, I don't know if it's plus or minus six feet. That's just a, a drop, and all there is is just like rough grass and shrubbery there right now. So yeah, uh, I hear what you're saying, and I thought kind of the same thing. And my partner, I had to do another drive by to see if that was accurate or not. But that that line is actually from Peter Ward surveying here in town, so I have to trust that that's accurate. Thank you. So 
I'll have to take a drive down there and have a look. I've uh, I've been uh, remiss. I forgot to ask you to introduce yourselves, and I think you have uh, I have a couple of partners here with and you. I, and I, I and my partner said remind you remind yourself to, to introduce yourself. So again, my my name is Joseph Schlachter, and I'm one of the directors with uh, Vendure Retirement Communities. And Drew Partners in the back corner here. He's, he's uh, another director with uh, with our group. Thank you. Thank you for doing my that. My apologies that I even had no, it on my paper. No, that's just fine. I, I was remiss. My that's that's my job. I'm supposed to be remembering that too. So thank you for that. Carry on, uh, Councillor Daly. A couple of quick questions. So, Vendor Community Retirement Communities Development Company and a management company. No, we are a development company, and our operating partner is Advocare Health Services. So once you finish, they would they, they will, get they will staff the facility for us. And they own it? No, we own the facility. You own it? Yes. They they staff it and run it for you. Okay. Publicly uh, out? No, we're a, we're a private organization. Okay. We're private funded. And Salmon Arm is the only other one, but you have some other projects that we own. Yes. And then we've got our, our background is building, and you know I've been in the industry myself for 25 years with multifamily care homes, commercial, retail, in, industrial institutions. <coughs> I've worked with some of the major national uh, construction and development and engineering firms in Canada. Okay, thanks. Uh, just the one other thing. I mean, we'll sure we'll get more detail on this variance, but it just it looks like it's the elevator shaft. Uh, is that the is that what's uh, above the allowed sixteen meters, or so is it the, more? the the height comes from the the rooftop, which is is this where I'm rubbing my cursor there. That calculation of height comes from there. Any ancillary, I think, and I can't don't quote me on the on the exact number, but I think it's anything under 10% elevator shafts, um, stair shafts, anything like that, do not count as the building height. So, so you tell me, do the cursor again where the height is. Right, where did you go? Because it wasn't it wasn't up there on the is. screen. Right here. Oh, so that height is actually going to be at 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 uh, 13 meters above Vernon Street. Oh yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know what I didn't do is I have one more because we I said two sure. variances. Can I just jump to the next yeah. slide because I'm not sure fair can. so you guys when you go around yeah. you're not having to jump back. And the next the next variance was the lot coverage and we're allowed 90% lot coverage on this property. And and you can see and I, I call them plates but they're not plates. These are the floor different floor levels that come through. So the the reason why we end up with a bit of a, an excess on the light lot coverage is. Our parkade is it covers less than, and this is the, this is the green box, uh, the green floor. The, the parkade level doesn't cover 94 percent; it's it's 90 percent or less. Each of the floors themselves do not cover, but because of some of the overhang and we got that parking in the back, we've we've allowed for our our upper deck to carry over top of that parking. And so, at this point in time, calculating the the, the compilation of all those levels together, there is an approach, there is a, an excess of up to 94 percent. Of, of, of lot coverage that we have on there. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention as well. So sorry, I just I wanted to get through those. Uh, oh, that's, those that's totally experience. fine. Before Thank you. you. Could I just ask a question for clarification as well? So you're, you're a Canadian-based company? Yes, we are. Based and out of Kelowna. You're based out of Kelowna. And where is Advocare based out of? Kelowna. Bo so both uh, Kelowna-based Canadian Correct. companies. Yes. And you, you do projects all over Canada? Uh, BC is our primary focus. Uh, Thank we've you. done projects all over Canada, but no, this business model is 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 out of uh, the basically the uh, British Columbia. Other markets include uh, Prince George right now, Nelson, and Salmon Arm is the one that's up and running already. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Purcell. Um, I'm wondering if you know. I mean, this it may be too early in the in the drawings and thinking about it. But what? How many um, public parking spots are you creating? There's along the back. There's 15 stalls along the back. 15 stalls. Yes. And then, and then underneath we have, I believe there was 50 parking stalls. For the covered. residents. We've dedicated, we've allocated for the residents at this point in time, knowing that we're not, we exceed the, the parking requirements. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm, one of the things that my partner and I were discussing is what we do with that parking. Is it available to public? Can we lease out spaces, things like that? Mm -hmm. um, there's, 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 a, there's a yes to that with a bit of a caveat is that we got to consider uh, seniors uh, safety. Mm -hmm. So if people, if there is access to the public, we have to figure out how to manage that so that there isn't uh, this public uh, running up and down our elevators and, and compromising the, the, the residents' uh, safety. Mm -hmm. I just have one more question as well. You have 125 suites. Correct. And how many of those are single units as opposed to uh, we couples? Have or? Six, there's six two bedrooms and the rest are all single bedrooms. Six two bedrooms, okay. Single one bedrooms. Uh, single one bedrooms. 
rest are singles. Okay, thank you. Councillor Purcell. Um, also, this, you may not be able to answer this question, but since you've worked with them in the past, Avro Care, do Avro they Care. typically staff from the area or do they bring people in from we, elsewhere? We staff and we're already dealing with this right now. We try to staff from the area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a massive concern right now that we're not going to have that. Sure, so okay. we're actually on the hunt already to try to figure out how we're going to manage that. And, and fill those sure. positions. Are there particular yeah. positions that you anticipate having difficulty filling? Um, more probably the entry level. Uh, I think nurses, managers, um, the entry level positions like a chef's aides, multi-service workers, which are cleaner, cleaners, and just assistants around the facility, um, they're going to be they're going to be tough to find. They're, they're lower lower income earners, um, which probably blends into my pre the previous discussion there on the affordable housing, which is something that we're it, it, I think we caught you guys at the right time because it's something we've been discussing and considering on our end of how we may or may not get involved with in that. Mm. So uh, yeah. that'd be great if we can include you in the discussion. That'd be great. To. So we we certainly are we certainly are have, you have the radars up on that, and we're we're going to be looking into that more. Has Avro ever considered a kind any kind of I don't know living wage policy or I don't know like just bringing the income up a little bit for those entry level positions so that they can actually afford rental units they, here? <laughs> I'll use the word yes. They are considering and they are being basically forced to, um, and that's just that's just a, a reaction to the economy. People just can't afford to. And we, and, and part of it is because we're private. Mm -hmm. um, unionized uh, positions pay more, sure. and so um, we we do uh, adjust accordingly. And so we are going through that process right now. Um, you know, the affordable housing thing is something that we're really getting our heads into right now as we bring it because we are going to have to bring in. I think the reality is we're going to have to bring in people from the outside to help mm -hmm. uh, support this facility. Mm -hmm. And where they go, uh, we got to have some sort of answers to that. Um, yep. whatever that is mm -hmm. so we're two years away from that point and mm -hmm. we have to figure something out mm -hmm. thank you yeah. councillor Sherbel uh, I would presume that this is sprinklerized the, the building that it I is um, and because it's uh, assisted living we are we, I, I believe it's a b3 and I'm, I'm not a code consultant but I believe it is it is sprinklered I think it's like a two-hour rating or something something to that nature but don't quote me on that thank you thank you um, Council, are we complete? Thank you for your presentation and thank you for, uh, this has been a piece of land within the Nelson community that's long been uh, talked about for various projects and it's, and uh, it was nice to hear your presentation. Well, we're very pleased to do it and, uh, and I had mentioned with a, with a couple of the council members before and in the planning department, um, I think the easiest way for us to get through it as a developer, um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of developers just come plowing through and throw some plans on your desk and then start screaming hard to get it going and I'm trying to avoid that so the more we involve <laughs> the community and the planning department and the city with the less the less surprises we're going to have down the road so uh, thank you it's our pleasure to uh, have this opportunity and thanks for joining us for the entire meeting today <laughs> it's enlightening and we always want to learn more about our community you so it's, certainly it's learned enlightening and there so, was a bit of a broad spectrum here today yes you know, and I, i'm a farm boy and i thought i knew everything about wildlife and now i, I learn more about uh, Skunks. Rats and skunks. Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, he's right. My, our dogs chase him around the farm all the time. And, and so. Okay. Just, thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Um, that, uh, that, that is it for our agenda, Council. Um, uh, we will not be adjourning quite yet because I think we're going back in camera. Oh, but we'll but, we'll, but uh, could I could have a motion to adjourn this portion. Okay, let's get Are we doing Thank you, Council Councilor Purcell. Yeah. Five minutes? No. Uh, yeah, two. We have to run and get it. Yeah, yeah, and run. run. No, we're not doing council reports. I don't know what we're doing. No, we're not doing council reports.